right, welcome everybody. We're live on YouTube now. <clears throat> so we're going to be uh, looking at different videos today. We're going to be looking at particularly the Trent Horn video. We're going to go through the totality of it. I've only seen clips of it, as I mentioned to the guys on Twitter. So uh, I'm not seeing the whole thing. Um, but I'm told uh, by people that watch the totality of it that it's really kind of pop level stuff. Not surprising there. Um, no nuance. Um, Trent chose, as we said, a brief video, a, maybe a 30, 40 minute video I did many years ago. And I don't fault him for that. But the problem with that is that when you, you don't get the nuance, right? If you choose uh, something like that. And a lot of these issues when it comes to especially papal quote mining um, requires some nuance, not because we have to explain it away, but because it doesn't, uh, there, it's a non sequitur, right? The conclusions don't follow from what the Roman Catholics usually take those quotes to mean. For example, first among equals is in, uh, intended to be extrapolated into Vatican I's no, notion of universal autocracy, ju uh, uh, judicial supremacy, ex cathedra, infallibility, indefectibility, etc. Right? Derived from uh, sometimes vague, sometimes uh, innocuous, sometimes flowery language, sometimes out of context quotes, uh, and, and wild extrapolations which contradict the councils themselves. Um, and so we, we don't want to look first at a video that uh, mm -hmm. Father Hears did covering Scott Hahn. And the problem with this is that uh, what is nuance? You don't know what the word nuance means? <laughs> People in the chat. Uh, the problem with, with Scott Hahn's approach is that it's very simplistic and not what we would have expected from somebody who's supposed to be sort of the, the premier Catholic apologist. So I want to look at a few points that Father Here has made in this video, because uh, I'm going to take Trent and uh, uh, Scott Hahn to kind of be the representatives of modern day Catholicism and, you know, sort of the most most popular exponents of it. And I want you to just pay attention to the, you know, fairly low level uh, argumentation that goes on here. And, and the, the point of today really is to show that it's a disservice to Roman Catholics, especially because people are falling for quote minds, falling for bad arguments because they're oversimplified. And I think that's a lot of what draws in the Roman Catholic crowd. Um, I mean, there's other reasons too, other motivations, other psychological reasons, cultural reasons. So I'm not going to go into that. But um, when it comes to overly simplistic arguments and the McKee's arguments, um, the quote minds, I mean, they're just so bad. And there's so many times based on forgeries based on deception based on um out of context quotes that it, it just it's it's even further going to be demonstrated by the laziness and the immaturity of the argumentation that we'll see in someone who's supposed to be an exalted theologian in the roman catholic sphere like scott Hahn. right he's probably the most famous lay apologist out there um but these these arguments are just kind of they're almost unbelievable. I, I couldn't believe how bad his argument. I mean, there's Protestants who can make better arguments than this. It's kind of embarrassing. So let's listen to uh, first Scott, and then we're gonna, we're going to get to uh, Trent's video. Scott Hahn and Father so I'll say this: that I wanted to go Orthodox. Hmm. I was drawn to the tell us why. Liturgy. Yeah, I mean you yeah. don't you don't have the the Pope, the stumbling block of the Pope at least. Yeah, I mean I was yeah, ordained Matt a Fried. pastor, and I Matt could be Fried ordained as a married man of a in the Orthodox full Church. Full of so icing, cake I wouldn't icing. Have to commit professional suicide like I would if I became a Catholic. And so what I did was I traveled around and I visited some Orthodox Christians. And I let, let me let me comment. I can't I can't not comment on that. He he's he's one of the most well known writers, teachers in Catholicism in America, I don't think he committed suicide, professional suicide. If you would have gone to an Orthodox, uh, uh, you know, little tiny church somewhere, you know, Ukrainian, Russian, Romanian, more likely he would have had less influence. So that's, it's a little weird. That is a good point Father Harris brings up. I mean, do you, are we, we're really supposed to believe that he committed career suicide going from Calvinism to Catholicism because of married priests? I mean, uh, I mean, the, the Catholic apologetic grift uh, is quite substantial and far more substantial than that uh, in the Protestant sphere. <laughs> so that he would make this kind of an argument reflects at the very beginning is odd and also really has nothing to do with what's true or false. I mean, your motivations for maintaining, um, you know, your 
career, your academic uh, prestige, none of that has anything to do with what's true or false. And so um, it's kind of irrelevant, but it is a kind of a flex. I think he's trying to say, well, look, uh, clearly I'm after the truth because I wouldn't have chosen Roman Catholicism because it's so devastating to my career. Well, no, actually you got promoted and, and, and put forward as sort of the premier, you know, lay apologist, but you would have definitely had a, a harder time, uh, you know, had you entered into a tiny Rocor church, right? And I think that's a good point that Father Harris brings up, which is just a, a bizarre way to start this critique of orthodoxy from Scott Hahn. He thought that was, uh, uh, you know, he made a big sacrifice by going to uh, Catholicism. I also visited a few Orthodox churches, and I realized very early that um, that Orthodoxy is ethnic. There's Greek, there's Ukrainian, there is Estonian, there's Serbian, there's Russian. And, you know, I, I always sort of, no, I didn't always. I had recently become suspicious of denominations, you know, and just the proliferation of denominations. And then when I realized there were more than a dozen autocephalous Orthodox bodies that are all defined by their ethnicity, I coined a term back then called denominationalism, mm. that if there's one thing the new covenant isn't, that the old covenant was, was ethnic and nationalistic, it was Israel first. So let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that for a minute here. So he's, he's uh, as, as do many apologists and contemporaries who looked at Orthodoxy and walked away, he's looking at the uh, the ethnic uh, character of orthodoxy, and he's uh, he's seeing this as inauthentic. And certainly, the if if there are uh, in the Orthodox Church those who are embracing a kind of Judaizing uh, mentality that one has to become uh, something they're not, some ethnic group uh, in order to become a Christian, then that is anathema. But that's anathema to the Orthodox Church. Instead of realizing that uh, the Church has always been local. And that each community took on a particular character, and then each local church picked on, took on a, a particular character. And this was a strength, and could be a great strength for the Orthodox Church because they enculturated deeply and redeemed and sanctified the culture. So, if you would have gone back a uh, hundred years ago to a very nationalistic Roman Catholic. A country that has now become totally secularized in Europe, uh, something like you know Spain or Italy or anything, they would have looked a lot like, and they would have been a lot like culturally speaking, because he's looking at something superficial culturally, the Greek or the Russian or the Romanian. In fact, when they came over to America, they had ethnic, they had very ethnic. Uh, yeah, this is surprising to me that Roman Catholics with a straight face still make this argument. I mean, has anybody, I can go 30 minutes from where I live and there is an entirely German Catholic community. Um, I have been to Cincinnati where it's entirely Germanic Catholic neighborhoods. I mean, really? Come on. This is just such an, uh, a flimsy and, and dubious critique. Again, uh, as Father Hears correctly notes, when we look at the history of Europe itself. I mean, you can go to Poland and who doesn't know that Polish Catholic nationalism is, you know, virulent, right? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's rabid. And, you know, having had discussions with Roman Catholics for many years, having been Roman Catholic, having had countless debates with Roman Catholics, it, it I mean, everyone knows that most Roman Catholics will openly tell you that they adhere to their position so vehemently because it is part of their history and their tradition and their heritage. Because that is no different than so-called nationalism. There's another variant of it. It's the exact same principle. So again, uh, a very uh, hypocritical sort of double standard when you hear this kind of argument, given how prevalent that is, in especially in Roman Catholicism. I mean, you can go to places in the world where, I mean, Croatia, right? Croatians hate Serbs, right? Roman Catholics versus Orthodox, okay? <clears throat> And again, the easy refutation of this is again to point out that let's get this down because this is a really strong refutation of the Roman Catholic argument. And the reason it's so strong is because they themselves make this self-refuting argument all the time, all the time. What is it? In their view, the, the Roman Catholic Church is the true church of the first thousand years, right? So we're going to look at the first thousand years. Now, from the Orthodox view, we think first thousand years of Christianity is fundamentally Orthodox, right? They say, no, 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 it's actually Roman Catholic. No, wait a minute. 
So if it's the Roman Catholic Church that is the true ecumenical council-based church of the first thousand years, then where does autocephalous churches come from? Where does autocephaly come from? Oh, actually it comes from the ecumenical councils according to various national churches, regional areas, etc. Autocephalous status. We see, for example, at the Council of Ephesus, the Church of Cyprus is given by ancient custom an autocephalous independent status. So every time a Roman Catholic argues that this is a fundamental rejection and departure from Christianity to have autocephalous churches, they're arguing against their own position and their own church for the first thousand years. Do you see how silly this argument is? I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. And we see this argument made by Ibarra. Ibarra says, uh, Orthodox Christianity is false because it has a, an Orthodox schism within it between the Orientals and the, Ortho and the, and the Eastern Orthodox. The, uh, hello, by your argument, that took place under your watch in the first thousand years under the Roman Catholic Church. So if schisms are indicators of false churches, by your own argument, the church of the first thousand years is Roman Catholic and caused schisms and is therefore false. You see how silly this, these are, these are terrible arguments. But this is what I'm getting at, and this is what I'm expecting we're going to see in the Trent video. Again, even though I've not seen the whole thing yet because it's kind of long. That's what I'm expecting to see. And that's the disservice here is really just bad arguments. Emotional arguments, cultural appeal arguments, uh, arguments from tradition, arguments from, uh, as I said, emotion, uh, argument, uh, appeal to heritage. These kinds of things are, are classics amongst Roman Catholic apologists. And yet... Anytime this comes up at all in, in the sphere of orthodoxy, that becomes one of their uh, uh, primary critiques, which again is very odd because it's, it's just not a very good argument. And again, uh, you know, if you think about Lofton, some of the arguments that Lofton and, and uh, people have come on and said against us in the last few years, remember that Lofton said, um, you guys have all the same uh, problems of ecumenism that we have. Therefore, you can't critique the papacy on the basis of ecumenism. Now, we've responded to this argument probably 20 times, but what's the, what's the flaw in this? What's the problem in this argument? Well, the problem with this argument is that it depends on the structure of the different institutions. If my church is built on one guy, one C, and that's the rock, and it's indefectible, and that church, that seed goes on to do things that prove that it, in fact, did defect and that it does not teach orthodoxy according to the Roman Catholic traditional position. Then that's a systemic level problem. That's a paradigmatic level problem, a presuppositional problem. You see. That's different than a decentralized church where if a bishop or a patriarch goes into heresy, it doesn't destroy the whole system. Because as Father Harris pointed out in that video, orthodoxy has always been local. It has always seen the church as a local manifestation. There's not a supreme super church in Rome and then every other church is sort of on a ontologically diminished status underneath that super church, dependent upon the super bishop, you see. Two different models of ecclesiology. And so they will just simply critique our position, assuming that our position is their ecclesiology. Oh, you guys have the Pope called the Patriarch and he did an ecumenist meeting. So your argument fails. Does anybody think the Patriarch of Constantinople is infallible and indefectible? No, of course not. There have been tons of heretical patriarchs in the history of the church. Many of them. The ecumenical patriarch has been a heretic many times. But it's just so astounding to me that after years of these discussions, years of these debates and interactions, they still don't get this argument and still act like, well, you have problems too. Yeah, but my argument isn't that you're bad because of ecumenism. It's that the papacy has confirmed a level and degree of extreme ecumenism, which only a few decades prior to Vatican II was explicitly condemned many times over as apostasy, as a surrendering of the gospel. Okay, that's a different thing than just saying, well, you have problems. We ain't got problems. Right? That's They always want to boil it down to that. That's not the argument. Nobody ever made that dumb argument. That's a deflection from 
and a insufficient response to the actual argument that was made. Churches in North America, the only difference they had was a, a, a administrative imposed unity. But even the unions who came over, and many of them became Orthodox in the 20s, they had a very ethnic approach, and they were part of the Roman Catholic. This is another great point, too. Uh, doesn't Scott Hahn believe in his own view that the Uniates are part of his own church? Okay, and, and, but the Uniates operate just like the Orthodox schismatics with all the same, quote, nationalism. So again, this becomes a self-refuting proposition because if ethnic churches are an indicator of a false church, then on his own argumentation, his church is a false church because it has Uniate ethnic churches. Do we see how silly how low level the arguments are from these people? Communion. So this is a very short-sighted and superficial uh, critique that, that yeah, exactly. Dr. Hahn is, is engaging in here. He had a little more historical depth and background, and he looked at things, how they developed in North America. He would see them in context and would not, not be uh, scandalized by them. America is a very unique place in the history of the world. It takes people from all over the world, and they come... They come here with many of them intending to go back to the old country, but they come here and they try to hold on to their identity in a melting pot community. So he could easily have seen this as a great strength that the church was so powerful and is so powerful in the Orthodox places around the world that the, they meld into and, and the identity becomes, it's incarnational. It takes on the whole community, the society, the culture, and it makes it all orthodox. It makes it all Christian. Yeah, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because uh, we want to get to the part about uh, Filioque. But, I mean, do, does he is he not aware of, you know, sort of the basic approaches to solving issues at the ecumenical councils? I mean, who does Scott Hahn think came to the council, right? Who came to Nicaea? Cardinals? I mean, what does he, what does he think? Does he not realize that it was patriarchates from various national churches the patriarch of alexandria the patriarch of antioch the patriarch of armenia or, or excuse me not armenia but uh the bishops of armenia the bishops uh, the bishops of various national churches i should say right would be coming to these early councils right what, what does that have to do with the later medieval roman catholic structure of ecumenical councils which become a uh, basically a purely papal phenomenon uh, with the later rise of the cardinalate, right? Again, totally different structure from the structure of the church in the first thousand years, right? Another example, in the ecumenical councils, it does not require the papacy to create bishops. Well, after the schism, after the first millennium, the Pope decides, no, I will confirm every bishop in the world. Again, a massive innovation, you see. Right. Well, and what's the Roman Catholic justifi justification? Oh, well, it's the Pope. He can make innovations, right? Because he is the living expositor and living interpreter of tradition. Well, again, wh why didn't this exist prior to that? Oh, well, you see, it evolved. Oh, it, it evolved. If it evolved, then how does Leo the Thirteenth and Vatican One argue that this was always the Church's view? Oh, because it was. You see, this this two different. These are mutually exclusive arguments. You can't argue with Leo the Thirteenth, uh, as Satis Cognitum does, as um, Pastor Eternus does, that uh, of Pius the Ninth, that the primacy, universality, Petrine, um, charism, all of these uh, uh, gifts to 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 Rome, they were always present from the earliest days of the Church. That's what that document. That's what those documents say. Then, however, in order to bolster this flimsy position they brought out cardinal newman's evolution of doctrine view evolution of dogma well you see it was a seed and it grew into a giant tree so wait, these are two mutually exclusive arguments which one is it because if it's from the earliest days then they have a they're on the horns of a dilemma they have to show and demonstrate the extreme views of vatican one present in the first thousand years the outlandish claims, right? But again, as we've seen so many times over and over and over, these people haven't even read Vatican I. They're not even clear on what Vatican I actually says, that it actually says that the Pope is also infallible in his universal ordinary teaching as well as his extraordinary teaching. 
Now, uh, last little bit here on Filioque, which is just extremely embarrassing for uh, Dr. Hahn. And I mean, anybody who's aware, I mean, this is, this is the top apologist, okay, for the Roman Catholic Church. So let's get this clear. And it just struck me that when I went to a Greek Orthodox Church, it was more Greek than I, I could be. Filioque. That's not the Filioque and I, part. And so they wanted, to, they thought this was a way to support the divinity of Christ. Uh, it was a terrible. Right. The Orthodox are right on that. But so it's listen, one of my. This, this admission from uh, Matt Fred. This, this is a funny admission from old Matt Fred here. Favorite discoveries. Yeah. Uh, that if so you. Just, just, just for people at home, the Filioque was something inserted by the church after the Council of Nicaea. That's so right. The Orthodox are right. No, it was not inserted by the church, it was inserted by the uh, Frankists and the Carolinian theologians, and then it was evangelized in Orthodox countries. And uh, the papacy at the time opposed it. These people don't know this. It's well known. Okay, Famous Uniate scholar Francis Dvornik has vindicated the Orthodox view of this. Is it, are people not aware of this? I mean, <clears throat> this is their own Uniate scholarship. But you see, Roman, Roman Catholicism is uh, whatever it needs to be at the time. And I think that the real strength of Roman Catholicism is that it's anything and everything. Do you want it to be a religion of uh, medieval knights and crusaders b valiantly going to war against uh, the sultan? Uh, okay, you can imagine it as that in your head. Do you want it to be the one world religion of Pope Francis and the Abrahamic faith center where all the Abrahamic faiths can come together and worship the same God, Allah, Vatican II, and Nostra Aetate. You can have it be that as well. You see, you can pray in the mosques like the last two popes have done openly towards Mecca, or you can be a crusading knight against Islam in the world of Roman Catholicism because it is a double think religion. It's full of this. It's full of the contradictions, right? It's full of the dialectical opposition. And I think that the reason some of these people are, they're half insane, a lot of them. I'm not mad at the Roman Catholics, but the way, the, the, the way that they act, the way they act so just unhinged, right, is because of this religion being so fundamentally incoherent. And every day they're faced with it. Every day they're faced with some new radical scandal that Francis does. And the, the answer to this is just always hand wave it and say, well, it's not it's not ex cathedra. It's not ex cathedra. I, I don't have to I don't have to worry about it because it's not ex cathedra. But that's not actually what Vatican One says. You don't get to hand wave all the ordinary and universal ordinary teaching of the papacy. In fact, the non infallible ordinary teaching you have to submit to with docility, as Catholic moral theology says, as Vatican One says. In fact, even the decisions of the Roman colleges. Even the decisions of the Holy Office, anything approved by the Papal See, you must submit to with docility, even if you think it's wrong. And yet, how many, a giant schism uh, within the Roman Catholic Church now, right, believes Francis is heterodox? Okay, well, let's set aside infallibility for the moment. What about Vatican I's teaching about the indefectibility of the Roman See, that the Roman See cannot defect from the faith? Okay, you can't separate the See, by the way, from the person who sits in the See. Are you aware of this? Okay, this is also a Vatican I idea. Okay, you can't remove the fundamental elements of what makes up the Roman See from the chair over in Rome. Okay, like the set of a contest do. Oh, I, I follow the seat of Rome, not the the See of Rome in my head right the uh, platonic idea of the seat of rome i don't actually follow the one over in rome because that one's apostate okay that's again vatican one says that's ridiculous et si multa the very argument that set of contest make is the exact same argument that the old catholics made and et si multa is written against the old catholics and the exact same principles that refute the old Catholics refute the side of a contest. But now, wait a minute. Does that mean that the answer is to follow Frank, to follow Francis? Well, but it actually looks like the set of a contest actually have a point because it actually looks like, and the, and the SSPX and all the trads, kind of looks like Francis isn't Catholic, isn't Orthodox in any sense of the word. So now we're on the horns of a dilemma between being a trad, SSPX, neo-Catholic, whatever you want to call it. 
But let's listen to this part. Then we're going to move to the Trent video. This is all I wanted to get to with this because this is, again, just – I'm just trying to show you guys. Do you understand the, the how low-level this pop apologetics is? And this is what holds people into that in that religion, this low-level stuff, this lazy, low-level stuff that's been – refuted by people in his own church just the astounding ignorance of dr scott hahn to his own roman catholic theologians like father francis devornick the great uniate scholar the vatican clarification on the filioque has he not even read that i mean it's kind of astounding on that but your point is that the the orthodox are wrong to deny that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. That's right. I mean, yeah. in the seventh century and beyond, you have a semi-Aryan heresy spreading in the West, mostly in Spain, that the church in the West has to respond to. And so the Bishop of Rome does by inserting the filioque so that the full divinity of the Holy Spirit is affirmed more explicitly. So he got it all wrong. I don't think he says he's very interested in this topic, but he got it all wrong. First yeah, of all, how can he be interested in this we, topic and not be aware of the basic argumentation in any of the scholarly literature on this? <laughs> right? Like, I mean, there's no awareness, right? I mean, the Foschian Schism by Father Dvornik, uh, Sashinsky's Filioque book, I mean, and a hundred other books. I mean, at least even, I mean, they have real, again, Roman Catholics have rehabilitated Photius. So, I'm supposed to believe if I'm a Roman Catholic, if I'm a Uniate, I can believe that St. Photius is a saint somehow, even though he was condemned for centuries. Now he's a saint. They reversed their position on this. Do, do you not see that this that alone refutes this whole thing? All of the Roman Catholic position is refuted just on this point right there. How is this not obvious to you people? I don't get it. It, it baffles me. It, it's not a difficult argument. You can have the reversal of someone being a heretic for centuries. Now they're considered a saint. But I guess it does actually make sense if the religion just is papalism, right? It's whatever the papacy says at that moment. That actually does make sense. And that actually is consistent with dogmatic evolution. If the dogmas evolve, then I guess the Pope is the apex of the religion. I guess Photius can be a heretic for centuries and now be rehabilitated as a saint, even though the whole logic of this argumentation is that the filioque is satanic, just as St. Gregory Palamas' apodictic treatise on the Holy Spirit argues that Rome is satanic. But now he's also a saint in the Roman Catholic communion, you see. Unless you want to be a trad, and then you can pick and choose and reject Photius and, P and Palamas as saints, which they do. But again, let's uh, let's... Let's let's not go too too deep into that because remember this is a consistent religion. Saw the Bishop of Rome did not insert it until the, the 11th century, the beginning of the 11th century. It had been inserted in the West in places around Rome, but Rome resisted it and didn't want to bring it in and yeah. have it. I mean, Scott Hahn isn't even aware of the fact that the papacy resisted adding the filioque to the creed. Who doesn't know this? I mean. Again, modern Roman Catholic scholarship has admitted this. The Vornix books. Sashinsky, who was Roman Catholic, now Orthodox, the leading scholar on this. Actually be a part and to confess it. In fact, they were with the Council of the Eighth Ecumenical Council, which we talked about earlier in this podcast. So he got that all wrong. And furthermore, they didn't put it in to show the divinity of the Holy Spirit, but the divinity of Christ. In... Yeah, the argument was that uh, if Christ sends the Holy Spirit, then he's equally divine with the Father. And actually, in terms of economia, that's fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, but that has nothing to do with the intra-Trinitarian relationship of the persons and the hypostatic origin of the Father, or excuse me, of the Spirit from the Father alone. Uh, there's this dumb argument that, that the Holy Spirit requires the Son, right? To, I mean... Okay, so who did the who who was required other than the the father to generate the son? Didn't the father generate the son whole and entire? Okay, so we don't need another person for uh, the generation of a person. Okay, we don't need two to have uh, the generation. Excuse me, the spiration of the spirit. So likewise, if the father can generate the son whole and entire, there's no lack, there's no uh, diminution, there's no subordination by teaching that. 
the Father can spirate the Spirit whole and entire without the Son as a co-source. And also this disturbs and destroys the entire balance of the Father as the sole cause, which is the decree and teaching of the, uh, the Second Ecumenical Council. The, the, the Cappadocian theology that the Father is the sole cause is accepted at Constantinople I. So not only are they denying uh, the balance of the Trinity, they're actually also rejecting the Cappadocian teaching that the Father is the sole cause. Uh, do you understand what the word sole cause means? Okay, that's from the Cappadocians. Okay, sole cause doesn't mean that he's also not the, you can't, you can't have the son also as a cause because then he wouldn't be the sole cause. Okay, it's not that difficult. And it doesn't prove the divinity of the son if he's also a spirator or a co-spirator or a co-cause because if causing a person is now what's necessary and proof of divinity, then you've subordinated the Holy Spirit because nobody believes that the Holy Spirit produces a person. These are all terrible arguments, and they're all terrible arguments that were dealt with a thousand years ago by St. Photius, whom the Roman Catholic Church says is a saint. I mean, this is a ludicrous position, a ludicrous church, so-called a para-synagogue, para-church, which changes its doctrines to fit the times. That's how Mother Teresa can pray in Buddhist temples. Mother Teresa can tell Time Magazine that her goal is not to convert people, but to make a Buddhist a better Buddhist. She's the archetypal saint of the Vatican II ecumenist religion, as is Pope John Paul II and his Assisi gatherings, which, by the way, Trent's going to talk about. I'm eager to see how Trent was going to explain th these away. We'll see what he says, but I'm going to tell you right away, I can already predict that I guarantee you Trent doesn't know the voluminous papal documents that we know. And I'm going to, I'll pull them all up for you. I'll give you the references. I mean, from his own papal chair, from the 1700s all the way up to prior to Vatican II, the papacy in dozens, 16 famous ones, 16 famous documents, 16 famous papal decrees, encyclicals, statements, dogmatic statements, including Lamentabili, which, uh, if I recall, that's part of Vatican I, condemn all of the things explicitly that occur at and after Vatican II. All you have to do is read, what's the most famous traditional Catholic publisher in the world? Pretty sure it's 10 books, okay? There might be some other one, Loretto, I don't know, but the most famous one, in, at least in America, that we all know about is Tan. Okay, Tan Books put out a book many years ago, very popular amongst trads, called Mortal. Excuse me, no, not Mortal Animals. Mortal Animals is in this book. It's called Popes Against the Modern Errors. All this is is 16 papal documents from Tan Books. Pretty much any Roman Catholic church in the world, I don't care where you go, even if they're the most liberal. In their library, they're going to have 10 books. Okay, this is not some fringe, wild, crazy publisher. Very well known. Every Novus Ordo church I've been to has 10 books. Devotionals, theology books, theology texts, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I mean, they published Ludwig Ott's classic Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. Okay. 10 books. Do you see this? 10 books. So 10 books put out this famous book, Popes Against the Modern Errors. I read this back in 2004 when I was a trad. It was one of the first trad documents I read. Trad books. Thank you. And this was my introduction to papal encyclicals when it comes to modernism, what modernism is, how it functions, what is the traditional Roman Catholic attitude towards it, and what are the forces of revolutionary thought, modernism, and so forth behind the critiques of religion in the West. And so even if you're Orthodox, I would actually say this is a valuable text to have. Uh, okay, not because uh, we want to make you Roman Catholic, but it's important to understand what the Roman Catholic Church's attitude was prior to Vatican II towards all of the things that Vatican II flatly, blatantly, clear as day accepted. Everything from religious liberty, previously condemned, in fact, there was a whole feast instituted called the Feast of Christ the King to combat 
the erroneous idea, the heterodox Protestant Masonic idea, enlightenment idea of religious liberty. Now, you can think what you want about religious liberty. I'm just pointing out that how many centuries did it take for the Vatican to condemn this? And what happens now? Oh, uh, there's all of these Jesuits and there's all these Dominicans that have written thousands of pages to actually show you the true, legitimate, like angle, like 66 dimensional chess version of religious liberty that's actually okay. Oh, sure. Okay, so what are the fruits of this? You'll know them by the fruits. Does anybody think that the fruits of the Vatican II religious liberty, the opening of the doors of the Vatican II church, what are the fruits of that? Catholics, would you like to tell us what the fruits are? Help us out here. I mean, you are the you you are the guys that have the sea that will direct us, right? Your whole thing is we don't have unity, we don't have knowledge of truth without the sea of Peter. Okay, to me, the flat out contradictions, according to your biggest traditional publishers in the freaking world, tell me that the Vatican has adopted all of the errors seen clearly in 16 papal documents that your Roman see is supposed to protect me from. So make this make sense to me. Now we see why they come after me personally, you see. What's their response to all this? Hand-waving, it's not ex-cathedra. Oh, really? So you, you think you only have to follow what's ex cathedra? Did you know that's actually condemned in Vatican I? The idea that as a Catholic, you can reject whatever you want unless you determine that it's, quote, ex cathedra. That itself is condemned in Vatican I. And I have covered that ad nauseum so many times. And what's their response? Go after me personally. Remember the guy that came on a week ago? People thought, oh, you're being mean to him. Oh, and who ended up being right there? He was being a total slime ball, wasn't he? Everybody saw that by the end of the conversation. Oh, I'm your friend, bro. I love your work, dude. You're my favorite. Oh, yeah, bro, bro. Jay, Jay, Jay. Repeating my name incessantly, which is an immediate giveaway. Nobody acts that way. Oh, bro, Jay, I love you so much. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. I want to be your friend. Oh, I love you. Oh, you're so great. By the way, you suck. Right? I mean, it's so obvious. Like, who can't figure this stuff out? It's not me being mean. It's me knowing after hundreds of interactions, hundreds, maybe thousands of interactions with these various groups, how they operate. All right. So uh, here is Father. Here's the video if you want to get uh, deeper into that. It's a really good overview. Again, showing the weakness of the pop apologists and... I put it into the chat there. You can watch his video. Uh, if, if we don't move on to the Trent video, we'll be here forever, dude. We're not going to be here for forever. We got to get down to business. <clears throat> All right. So this is, I don't remember when our debate was, but I think this is before our debate. So uh, this, this is a little bit spicier, uh, Trent. This is, this is Trent in his, spicy persona where he, he'll call me out a little bit here at the beginning. So let's see where he goes. Um, I know there's people in the chat here. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll open up the chat <clears throat> when we get through this. Um, so again, to recap, uh, this is an older video. It's from July of 2021. Uh, I'd forgotten about this video and then it popped up in the search engine algorithm. So I thought, Oh, I need to actually respond to that. And if you guys don't know on YouTube, um, Pro and con videos will sometimes get algorithm, algorithmic promotion. So if I did a video and then somebody did it against me, sometimes they'll do it. They'll promote both of the videos to get both of them kind of churning. So um, I think this is a response. This is a response to my 10 reasons I'm not Roman Catholic video, which is I think about 35 or 40 minutes. So again, the disadvantage of, I don't blame Trent for doing this, but the disadvantage of that is that if you go after those, those, uh, brief boil down videos it overlooks a lot of the nuance and we've done so many uh, I mean probably a hundred hours of live streams going into the nuance right on uniatism on uh, papacy in the early church interview interviews with Ubi um, interviews with uh, Lewis uh, you know so many so many people 
um, touching on and getting into the depth of the history of the papacy. Uh, but let's get into it and, and keep in mind, too, that a lot of what Trent brings up is it addressed in depth in a lot of the other talks that we did. Because uh, Lewis watched this whole thing and kind of deconstructed it. I've not seen the whole. I've only seen pieces of this. But keep in mind that I thought I had Ubi's channel up here. Uh, I want to have Ubi's channel on hand because a lot of these uh, arguments are already addressed in more depth in Ubi's excellent work. So I'll have his channel handy here but i don't know where we're going to go so let's let's see where trent takes us well you don't miss any more rebuttals like these and consider supporting us at trenthornpodcast.com now i need to clarify something at the outset i have a strict policy of not doing rebuttals to rebuttals of my rebuttals i'm not going to get stuck in an infinite loop so if dyer makes a rebuttal to this video i'm not making another rebuttal however well, okay, I understand not getting in an infinite loop, but what if the arguments are good? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you want to respond to good arguments? That's, that's an odd approach. So let's see what is however is. I do usually offer to debate people who make rebuttals to me, and I'll extend that offer to Dyer as well. Now, actually, a few years ago, I invited Jay Dyer onto my podcast to talk about the papacy. And then he said he didn't want to talk about the papacy. He wanted to talk about divine simplicity. Uh, so I looked him up a little bit more before agreeing to that. And I saw his conduct in other debates and exchanges with apologists. I found him to be very unprofessional and uncharitable. So I didn't follow up. Interesting. Um, how unprofessional and uncharitable on average are most of the Roman Catholic apologists, I wonder, especially in the trad world? Uh, that's an interesting question to ponder. But uh, first of all, in regard to that, email from a few years ago um i had already stated to trent right away i'm not that interested in in the papacy because that's a debate that's been had so many times and uh i had been putting at that time i think th three years ago a lot of research into absolute divine simplicity and so that was fresh in my mind um i told trent later on you know we could, i'd be happy to set up some other debates too so i'm not totally opposed to that but uh, the reason that that didn't occur wasn't from my vantage point. It wasn't because I didn't want to debate him on the papacy. What Trent said was, you can come on Catholic Answers Radio for 30 minutes. Sorry, but uh, a 30-minute spot you know, to talk about divine simplicity is not sufficient. Okay, So that's, that's what happened there. And I'm not faulting Trent because he didn't know who I was. And so uh, you know, I'm not saying he was like scared or it wasn't anything like that. I think he thought, well, who is this person? Now... To be a little clearer, uh, I mean, even then, I had a much larger audience and a much larger channel. So, uh, you know, if Trent was looking to expand his audience, it seems like he would have wanted to give it, you know, a little bit more of a, of a space to a real debate than a 30-minute segment on absolute divine simplicity, which would go absolutely nowhere. I mean, if you guys remember from the debate that we did on natural theology, I mean, we did, I think, two hours, and, and we didn't even really get sufficiently into the topic right a lot of people complained about that because the structure of the debate uh just didn't allow for that i mean it wasn't anybody's fault but that we had a, kind of agreed to it um to to be basically a two two hour-ish debate so i think suan on his channel didn't want it to go over that anyway so but again no you can't really debate absolute divine simplicity in the span of 30 minutes okay so that's what happened in that debate um and then, of course, he says, well, then I went and looked him up, and uh, that's when I found out he was just a, such a mean person. On the dialogue invitation, because I don't do dialogues with people who can't be professional. Uh, however, a debate is more structured, so I think we could have a good exchange in that kind of format. Now, this whole idea of, uh, oh, I'm professional and he's unprofessional— it's a little dubious because I've never billed myself as a professional debater, as a professional apologist. Um, I do those things and I talk about those things, but I've almost always put myself out there as a kind of satirical, uh, philosophical figure. So my bio has said that for many, many years. Uh, the first thing listed is author and comedian. And that's because I don't take myself that seriously. 
And so to look at a selection of debates, uh, such as the, the phase in 2017, 18 of blood sports is really kind of dishonest in the sense that nobody really thinks that those were professional, serious debates. They were always billed as, uh, internet entertainment. And I don't, I've never seen anything particularly wrong with that. Right. Uh, but this idea that, oh, uh, you know, this sort of intellectual, uh, sophisticated snobbery that, oh, uh, I, I wouldn't taint myself with going into that dirty sphere of unprofessional people. Well, I did taint myself with that. Um, I was happy to do those debates with people in that sphere, JF and others, and we helped a lot of atheists come to believe. Sorry. So that was the real motivation for that. Uh, I had no plans to be a debater is something that happened kind of on the spot and then it snowballed into more and more debates. So there was no attempt at, I'm going to set out to be the next William Lane Craig. I'm going to, I, I don't care about that. I, I, I don't care for intellectuals. I don't care for academics. They get on my nerves on the whole because they're brainwashing state appointed goblins, basically. Um, now there are plenty of academics that I appreciate and respect and people I've learned from. Sure. Uh, but, on the whole, um, I mean, I would have thought that Trent could sort of pick out and figure out from what I put out there and what I do that, you know, I'm not trying to bill myself as this serious person. And on top of that, it also should have been easy to verify if we have done many cordial, professional, serious debates. And we have. And there are far more of those than there are the goofy sort of angry debates. And it's also, uh, again, not really giving context to point out that, you know, I don't hop on debates to just get mad at people. Uh, if there's a, a, a heated situation, um, and again, I'm, I'm a fallen person. Yeah, I can get into my passions. I can get heated and get uh, mad like anybody else can. But I'm not out there to be unprofessional and to go after people. In fact, uh, we never went to try to get other people deplatformed. Uh, we never went after people, uh, you know, one on one in terms of personal life or these kinds of issues. That's not typically what I do. Um, every now and then I've had to make personal replies to people. But I think people can look at the body of the work that I put out, you know, the thousand videos and the, the hundreds of articles and books, hundreds of articles and three books. Um, how much of that is, quote, going after people and being unprofessional? A very small percentage. OK, so but what these people do is they'll pick. Oh, look at him, uh, you know, yelling at this idiot T-Dump here. Look at him yelling at this idiot, the Kurgan. And that's all he does, which is, again, totally not true, right? There's probably been, I don't even know, 15, 20 debates, okay? Multiple debates with PhDs, multiple debates with well-known public figures, multiple debates with public well-known Muslim figures, atheists, okay? Are, those are all cordial civil debates. So the idea that, uh, it's just a mischaracterization that, that tries to make me look like I'm some sort of idiot when I openly admit that I'm an idiot and I do ridiculous satirical videos all the time. Also, Dyer sometimes says, OK, if we're going to do a debate, it's got to be next week. Well, I'm pretty busy when it comes to debates. Next no, I didn't say that to you, Trent. I uh, did not say that to you. I said that to goobers like Timothy Gordon. Because Timothy Gordon, uh, William Albrecht, these are the individuals who will say, I will debate you in three months. I will debate you in six months. And this is a tactic that we've seen from these people who then six months later will say, give me another six months with Albrecht. Give me another six months, right? So that's a tactic that they use to delay the debate. And then when you finally get, rid get tired of this nonsense and say, I'm done with you, then they say, ha ha, he won't debate. He wouldn't step up. I gave him a public platform. It's the most feminine, whiny, silly, childish thing. And both Albrecht and Timothy Gordon did it. And so that's why I typically say, well, how about next week? How about, how about today? How about later on you hop on? Okay. So that's why I did it. it and I don't remember doing that to you. I might've said that to you. I don't know this, that he's talking about a, a tweet exchange from four years ago. Um, but as you can see, so I think Trent did this video before we had our debate. Uh, did I avoid a debate because Trent wouldn't do it that day or that week? No, I did not. We did a public debate. So again, this characterization also turned out not to be accurate. Month, I'm going to debate Alex O'Connor again on atheism, doing a debate on abortion. 
uh, with a philosopher who's written a lot on that subject. I've got a dialogue with an atheist on the historicity of Luke in September. So my debate with Jay Dyer on, let's say, the papacy or on the authority of the apostles' successors uh, might have to wait till the fall. Hopefully he can accept that. All right, with that out of the way, here is my rebuttal of Jay Dyer's 10 Reasons He's Not Catholic. Catholicism. So let's start with the first one, which is the papacy. <laughs> if the dogma of papal infallibility is the foundation stone of the church, uh, that is what Vatican I says. Pastor Eternus is very clear. We've done many videos. We've, we've outlined this many, many. Okay, to be clear, too, uh, yes, I'm correct. So our debate happened November 2021. And this video from Trent was July. So July, August, September, October, November, four months before. And so you can see that um, some of these characterizations uh, were not really accurate, right? Like, like, oh, uh, I didn't really want to debate Trent unless he, like, I got him to do it on the spot. Again, um, this is a, a tactic that they do. I'm not saying Trent is necessarily doing this because he also did agree to the debate, but uh, with people like Gordon and Albrecht, who are just completely disingenuous uh, individuals, um, that's what they do. And that's why I have tended to Roman Catholics to say, no, we're not going to have a debate in six months that you will forget about and then ask for another six months uh, delay on. Uh, how about you just come and debate it? Like what, 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 and by the way, what are you going to do in three months? Oh, I'm going to read all your Eastern Orthodox sources, Timothy Gordon said. Really? Really, you're going to read uh, 20 years worth of uh, Orthodox theology in a couple months? Come on, dude. Times. I'm not going to rehash all that. I will put below a couple articles in the comments. I'll link two articles in the comments where I've covered this in detail if you want to read uh, the actual. So note that, uh, again, this is a summary video that uh, Trent is critiquing, and my video original links to the longer explanations. Citations. It would take forever if I just sat here and read all the citations. So, um, we know the elements that are laid out in Vatican I as to what makes the church one, what makes it visible, what makes it unified, what makes it have its uh, force and power in the world, and that's the office of Peter, the See of Peter. Uh, the See of Peter cannot ultimately be divorced from Rome. Uh, it always has that connection, even during the Avignon Papacy. It still can't be divorced from Rome. Uh, and that's made, again, very clear at Vatican I in canon law and many of the documents that we've covered recently. So the question then is that if this is the one true church, then there ought to be a continuity. There ought to be a consistency. And most Roman Catholic apologists will admit, uh, as Ibarra did in the debate, if you, if you can find a dogmatic contradiction, then you've disproven the whole Roman system and the whole papacy because it's all built on this house of cards, you see. So the first doubt and the first question that came into my mind is, uh, again, why, if this is the foundation stone of the actual praxis of the church, wouldn't it be the first d uh, dogma that is that is uh, uh, defended and defined at the ecumenical councils? Wouldn't Nicaea or perhaps an earlier council like Gangra have dealt with this dogma itself? Why is this the last extraordinary dogma? You can't fool God. You can't cheat God. He knows who you are. No, I don't have ad blockers on. So, so you're going to hear a lot of uh, dumb PureFlix ads here. So. <laughs> His argument is that if something is foundational, then we should see a dogmatic definition of it very early in church history. But there are several foundational theological truths that weren't defined until much later in church history. The real presence of Christ in the Eucharist wasn't formally defined until the 13th century, after some people like Berengar of Tours began to promote the false symbolic view of Christ's presence in the Eucharist. Or consider scripture. Uh, consider, for example, the inerrancy of Scripture, Scripture being without error. I would say the infallibility of Scripture is just as foundational as the infallibility of the papacy. And while we do find references to inerrancy in Augustine and even as far back as Clement in the first century, but the ecumenical councils kind of restrict themselves on the matter. So, for example, the councils of Florence and Trent, not the podcast, the council, talk about Scripture being inspired and canonical, but they don't explicitly address the conditions under which Scripture is without error. And we don't see popes or, ec or ecumenical councils teaching about this until the late 19th century and 20th century, when you have a lot of critics challenging Scripture. But this doesn't disprove that long before that point, the Church believed that Scripture is without error. 
just like the 19th century definition of papal infallibility at Vatican I does not disprove the long-standing belief in the Church that the Bishop of Rome will not lead the Church into error. In the 16th century, St. Francis de Sales said that the Pope, quote, cannot err when he is in cathedra, that is, when he intends to make an instruction and decree for the guidance of the whole Church, when he means to confirm his brethren as supreme pastor and to conduct them into the pastures of the faith. In 622, an Eastern monk named St. Maximus the Confessor said of, quote, the most holy church of the Romans, that it is in no way overcome by the gates of Hades, according to the very promise of the Savior, but holds the keys of the Orthodox confession and faith in him. It shuts up and locks every heretical mouth that speaks unrighteousness against the Most High. All right, so let's do, uh, deal with this first. So Trent's uh, reply is that Jay has a bad argument because if Jay was right, then every doctrine that's later defined should have been defined early on in the early church. That wasn't really what I said. I didn't say that every doctrine ought to have been defined in the first century or in the first three centuries or five centuries. What I said was, if the rock of Peter, if the sea of Peter, according to Vatican I and Satis Cognitum, Pastor Eternus, right, these, these documents, Pastor Eternus is part of Vatican I, if that is so clear and so early, we should have seen some kind of clear reference or dogmatic statement on this in the first several centuries. And that was the argument, right? The argument is not that every doctrine should have been dogmatically defined early on in the church. The doctrine is that the doctrine of the church in the Roman Catholic paradigm is so fundamental. The doctrine of the papacy, the doctrine of the keys is so fundamental to their whole epistemology. We should have seen something like that, at least in the creed. And yet in the creed, what expresses the essentials of the faith, the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed, there's nothing like that. So let's get this clear what the argument was. According to Trent, the fundamental foundational doctrine of the church is the Roman see. That's the epistemic presuppositional starting point for every Roman Catholic. It's the starting point of their theology. That's what they will appeal to for how you even, quote, know the scriptures, the papacy, the papacy, the papacy, right? So not only is it a dogmatic thing, it also, in an odd way, becomes an epistemological principle. And so I was making the argument that, given the big nature of those claims about the Roman See, you see, it should at least be in the niceno Constantinopolitan Creed. Now, what does the Creed say? I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Uh, anything in there about Peter? Anything in there about the indefectibility of the Roman See? No. So that was the argument. And I admit that not every, the totality of the Orthodox position and critique is not going to hinge on this. Okay. Uh, I was just making an observation that why do we see such a divergence in the modus operandi of the church in the second millennium in the Latin West versus the admitted modus operandi of the church in the first thousand years, admitted now by Roman Catholic and Orthodox approaches. In other words, what does the Chieti document say, right? The Chieti document talks about, admitted by the papacy, that in the first millennium, the Roman see did not exercise The universal supremacy, in, excuse me, in the first thousand years, the Roman seed did not exercise the universal supremacy as it did in the first thousand years. Making sure this is the right document. Yeah, this is it. I'm trying to remember which paragraph it is. From Nicaea on, 
solutions to problems were dealt with through ecumenical councils. And it's making the point out the synergy uh, of the Bishop of Rome with the other bishops was the normal modus operandi. So it was not a unilateral operation. Uh, there's a specific paragraph that talks about, and it, by the way, it cites the apostolic canons, which of course the Orthodox Church uh, typically still refers to. Um, it was not a unilateral system. By the way, here is the text of the Chieti document. Now, when this comes up, you bring this up to the trads. Oh, they just hand wave it. Oh, I don't care. Oh, you don't care? Well, now, wait a minute. This is a papally approved document. So you're saying that the Pope approves of a document that admits our position, but he's still the Pope, right? So is he misleading us in approving this document? In approving the Chieti document? And by the way, here's the link to the Chieti document. There you go. And then what happens is you get into the endless spiral of the authority of the documents debate with the Roman Catholics. Oh, it's not ex cathedra. It doesn't matter because you should still submit to it with docility if it's the ordinary teaching. Well, I don't have to submit to an ecumenical document. Okay, but the Pope approved it. So is he orthodox or not in your view? Anyway, this talks about collegiality. This is a famous document admitting collegiality is the point of it. Anyway, so you can go read it. And it talks about how the Pope did not have universal uh, jurisdiction uh, in the first thousand years. And of course, that uh, Maximus quote has been dealt with uh, many, many times. And yeah, it's true that uh, when Maximus is appealing to Rome, he does cite and tout the uh, shining orthodoxy of the Roman see. And it's true that uh, as long as Rome pronounced Orthodox teaching, many church fathers would say Rome is Orthodox, right? And it does shut the mouths of many of the heretics. However, does that mean that, Ro that the Roman church never had heterodox popes? What about the very council where this comes up, the sixth council, which proves and confirms St. Maximus's teaching? So in other words, the very theologian of the sixth council that Trent is trying to uh, appropriate here, that very theologian whose, whose works are confirmed by the Sixth Ecumenical Council, that very council condemned the teaching of Honorius, and not just that council, but three later councils further affirm that Honorius did teach heresy. So the Roman Catholics will appropriate this, not give you the context, right? Because Maximus also says, the famous quote that Lossky cites in his works, that I would be with the small band of the Orthodox rather than the big numbers of the heretics. So he doesn't just follow a church because they're a prominent church. In fact, he says that a patriarchate such as the Patriarch of Constantinople can fall away. By the way, this quote does not say what Vatican I says. It says, it is in no way overcome by the gates of Hades, according to the promise of the Savior. It holds the keys of the Orthodox confession and faith in Christ. Does it say that it infallibly always holds that? Well, we had already had multiple pap uh, papal adherents and papal claimants and papal uh, office holders, right, who had committed heresy. Pope Vigilius. Pope Honorius. And this is just, again, a quote mine, which could be read in either an Orthodox or a Roman Catholic way. But again, it does not say that the Church of Rome and the uh, successors to the See of Rome have an indefectible, infallible charism, but rather it refers to their confession of him. And other quotes in Maximus make it clear that he will follow any church that is orthodox so in other words rome has this honor because it's orthodox not because it's rome do you see the difference there and that's why it's not a vatican one statement and that's why the modus operandi the praxis of the sixth council refutes this misuse as well as the misuse of the pope saint agatha letter which i'm sure he's going to bring up too so again both of these quotes are quote minds 
that are intended to give the impression that St. Maximus teaches Vatican I. But wait a minute. That quote is not the equivalent of what the teaching of Vatican I is. Confession and faith in him. It shuts up and locks. Does the, did the Sixth Council believe that that was the case when they condemned and excommunicated Honorius? The very actions of the council, the very canons of the ecumenical councils, go against the reading and interpretation that he has of this quote line. Ice terms. Uh, and then that, I think, leads to the issues that I raised in the top five reasons uh, that top five easy ways to refute the, pa the papacy. Uh, and the second of those top five reasons, you'll have that link below. You can read all this. This is not my, my second reason not to be a Roman Catholic. This is just the, the top five reasons that are easily. Right. By the way, so people in the, qu in the chat are asking about the uh, quote from Irenaeus. Um, so Abgate's book is really good on that, where he shows that, again, it's totally con contradictory to the, the way that they, they will read it. He just chose Rome because of its double honor, right, because of Peter and Paul. That's why Irenaeus chooses Rome as the example of apostolic succession against the Gnostic heretics. There's nothing about uh, an infallible charism, nothing about anything to do with the special office of Peter. In fact, Vatican I condemns the idea that Rome is significant or special because of it being a Peter and Paul relationship. Vatican I is very clear that the only basis for the Roman seed's primacy, universality, indefectibility, and infallibility is the Petrine office and charism. So that makes the Irenaeus quote irrelevant to the Roman Catholic apologetic. You see that? And by the way, we did a whole interview with Ubi on the Irenaeus quote. So I can give you that as well because I'm sure that's all they ever do is go to like the same 20 quote. My basically just go to Catholic answers and then just cut and paste what's on their proof of the papacy page. Okay. It's, it's just, it's just a cut and paste job. They never go into any of the nuance or the, the actual praxis of the people that make the comments. Right. So remember if a council says something like the Maximus quote or the Pope St. Agatha quote, and then they do the exact opposite of that, then maybe that's not the right reading of the council, or excuse me, of the quote. Does that make sense? Like, how are they going to excommunicate somebody from the Roman See if the Roman See is indefectible? Hello, right? That's clearly not the meaning or the context or the modus operandi. And let's keep in mind, too, that the opuscula is, I don't think it is even translated into English yet. So I'm not sure where uh, Trent got that uh, translation of St. Maximus's opuscula. Um, but just because he picked it up from a Roman Catholic source also doesn't mean that it's necessarily solid. By the way, if a council can excommunicate a pope, then the council is above a pope, you see. So, and, and that's all that's needed to disprove the Vatican I position. Because the whole argument hinges on the Vatican I definition. So here is the... Uh, interview that we did with Ubi, where we go into a lot of uh, depth uh, in terms of academic depth with the Irenaeus quotes. So Ubi goes through quite a few of the classic quote minds there. Um, I think we talk about the St. Maximus quote in that as well. So there is that link. I'll try to remember to put it underneath, underneath the video as well. Uh, uh, demonstrable proofs that the Roman Catholic Church has changed its position dogmatically. And one of those examples I gave in that article was the death penalty, how this was formerly seen uh, for many, many centuries in the Roman Catholic Church as an aspect of natural law. Natural law obviously can't change. And yet now this is seen to be something that is uh, accidental and, and changeable in relationship to, to natural law. And so even the trads themselves in the Roman Catholic world are hotly debating, oh, Francis didn't really mean this. He didn't really mean that you don't have to, even though the catechism, which is part of the normative ordinary teaching of the church, has been, it gets updated to reflect these uh, changes and these updates. Uh, they still wrangle and cope and engage in the mental gymnastics to try to, say, to try to say, that. oh, but it's not really changed because the Pope can't actually go against tradition. Actually, the Pope defines and interprets tradition. Okay, let's talk about the death penalty, because no matter how you look at this issue, it doesn't disprove either papal infallibility 
or the infallibility of the church as a whole. Now, wait a minute, Trent. Remember, the, the argument for the papacy is not merely just to accept infallibility. I thought the office of the papacy was going to provide unity, guidance, moral clarity on these issues. So notice when scandals, uh, obfuscation occurs, what does the Roman Catholic pop apologist do? Let's minimize the doctrine, minimize it, right? Oh, it doesn't mean really any of that. It's very minuscule. And then he'll shift it later on when he's arguing with, say, an Orthodox person. And let's say he wants to point out the so-called disunity or lack of clarity in the Orthodox world. Then it becomes maximized and the, pa the Pope becomes this constant living oracle by which we should all hang at his feet to see what great guidance and wisdom will drop from heaven because of course he's elected by the holy spirit at the enclave right so do you notice the two-step between the minimizing of the significance of the doctrine and the maximizing of the doctrine it depends on what's necessary in the case at that time and you will constantly see the roman catholic apologist shift between these definitions when it's when it suits the argument when it fits the case and so right now in this case trent i think knows that there's massive lack of clarity and and uh, clear evolution on this idea of the death penalty i mean does anybody know i mean you guys know what the papacy used to say about the death penalty you can find uh tridentine era popes saying that for example for pedo priests it was necessary that there be the death penalty i think pius v uh, is the, if I recall, is the one that says that. But if not, it's one of the uh, uh, Tr Tridentine era popes. No, wait a minute. So, in the time at the time of Trent, the moral clarity of the office of the papacy told us very clearly that PEDO priests should be put to death. Now, however, we there's not so much moral clarity, and this doesn't have anything to do with ex cathedra. Well, wait a minute. I thought that the papacy was more than just ex cathedra. It's also suppo supposed to be unity and moral guidance. You sell everybody on this argument. You tell everybody they need this position and this office to have moral clarity, unity, guidance, and holiness in their life. And then you turn around and deflect and act like whenever there's giant scandals and lack of clarity, has not, it, that, oh, well, it's not infallible. It's not ex cathedra. You guys are duplic duplicitous. Is this not obvious? How can it be morally correct from the standpoint of natural law to put people to death for millennia and now it's not so clear and morals aren't under ex cathedra? Really? In fact, is it, isn't moral law and natural law and natural justice in your goofy system, isn't it more certain and more clear than the dogmas? It's supposed to be, right? So one option is to say that the teaching saying the death penalty is moral is an infallible teaching that can't change, and what Pope Francis says about it in the Catechism is a prudential judgment Catholics aren't bound to follow. The, the Pope never declared the death penalty to be intrinsically evil. Uh, no, that's not true. In fact, in my essay, I show and I cite where Francis says it is a violent act and it is no longer necessary. So Trent doesn't go to the actual documents. Uh, that's, if I recall, that's the exact wording that he uses, right? And I actually did cite the sources. So you can go find my paper. Let's see. I mean, Francis has said this multiple times, by the way, not just about the death penalty, but he says that any act of violence at all is contrary to religion. Okay, he's famous for saying this. So Trent is not being correct or accurate in what the Pope actually said, but I mean, no shockers here, right? Um, let's see, death penalty. I mean, he has to know that the papacy clearly says that it is a uh, brutal, uh, barbarous act, I think is the terminology that, that's used by Francis. Does anybody remember the exact terminology? Uh, I'm trying to remember what what my essay was on this. I think it's my, uh, I think I put it in the top 
five reasons. Yes, that's it. So top five reasons I'm not Catholic. Or no, top ten, I think. No, that's going to be the video. But notice the logic of this position aside from these issues. Now we're not only saying that the, the Pope is the uh, ultimate interpreter of, I think it's this one, of the theology of the church. Now we're saying that, okay, here we go, changes on the death penalty. So Francis has his own views. Uh, I think this is a Catholic website pointing out how th it's an error. That Francis's view is an error, in other words. But again, notice that, that this is not, this is moral law. This is natural law. So I thought the office of the papacy was there to help guide us in religious uh, areas, right? Faith and morals. But now natural law? requires the Pope to tell us what it is, even though the death penalty in traditional Catholic theology has been seen as natural justice. So, so it is natural ju justice and natural law change. Well, according to Francis, it does, right? And then what we have is Cope, I'm trying to find ex uh, Francis' exact words about uh, the barbarity, right? Christian faith. Okay, we don't, we don't know about that. By the way, John Paul II said the exact same thing too. He said the uh, he said it was in, un, unjust. Okay, so notice that. Trent is trying to deflect it into a optional issue when John Paul II and Francis both have called the death penalty barbaric and unjust. So how is natural justice now unjust? That, I, that's what doesn't make any sense. That it shouldn't be used anymore. Uh, no, that is what he says. So Trent just told you that Francis doesn't say it shouldn't be used anymore. Yes, he does. That's exactly what he says. find his words better by doing it this way okay so it was in Fratelli Tutti which ratified the Catholic position against the death penalty uh, I mean how come everybody else can seem to understand what Francis clearly means that uh, it's inadmissible according to the Vatican and then we have to have Oh, Francis said it is, quote, contrary to the gospel. That's it, right? Death penalty inadmissible, according to Vatican News. Congregation, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which Vatican I says that you do have to follow as a Roman Catholic. You do not have the liberty to pick and choose what you interpret the CDF to say. The new, the new text reads, recourse to the death penalty on part of legitimate authority was long considered appropriate. For certain crimes, although extreme, uh, it is a means of safeguarding the common good. Although it's extreme. Today, however, there's increasing, increasing awareness that it is uh, against the dignity of the person. Uh, again, how, how come nobody in traditional moral law or in natural justice, natural law, understood that it was against the dignity of the human person? A new understanding has emerged. I mean, is this not clearly a change? And he said the, the the new text, Francis's quote is, the death penalty is inadmissible because it is an attack on the dignity of the person. The church works for the abolition worldwide of the death penalty. That's Francis's words. What did Trent say? Uh oh, Trent said, Francis never says that. Church as a whole. So one option is to say that the teaching saying the death penalty is moral is an infallible teaching that can't change, and. We'll
in your system, moral law, natural law, aren't determined by the Pope. They're natural. Likewise, there's the classic traditional Catholic concept of natural justice. I mean, I think all that stuff's silly, but that's the Roman Catholic traditional view. So now he's trying to frame it as a, is it infallible or not? Actually, it has nothing to do with infallibility. It has to do with natural law. Pope Francis says about it in the Catechism, is a prudential judgment Catholics aren't bound to follow. Uh, that's one option. He's saying that you have the option that is Francis's prudential judgment that you don't have to follow. You have the right, you think, to not follow the, the, the Catechism the normative teaching of Francis in terms of his encyclicals? You don't have that right. You literally just stated what is condemned in Vatican I. Now, he's giving different options, so maybe he doesn't think this. Maybe he thinks that this isn't the right position, right? But as we have covered ad nauseum, okay, Denzinger, are you familiar with this, Roman Catholics? This is your book. I know it like the back of my hand, Denzinger. See that? What does Denzinger say? Well, in 1683, it says, you are bound to follow all of the decisions of the Roman congregations. So this is a document from Francis Fratelli Tutti and also from the CDF, and that means you have to follow it. Denzinger number 1698 says, you must follow all the judgments and decrees, and you may not doubt them even if you disagree with them. So, again, you'll notice the two-step, the Roman Catholic two-step, whenever they're presented with a problematic document, statement, decree, they throw the magic fairy dust of not infallible. Whenever they want to prove their specific pet Roman Catholic view, they throw the magic dust of infallible. You see that? They do it all the time. Now, there's actually four of these. Okay, Denzinger, 70, 1792, 1698-1683, 1683 and those are the decrees that deal with from Vatican I that deal with what you're bound by and beyond just the universal ordinary magisterium okay there's the extraordinary magisterium which is ex cathedra or Roman or the Pope approving a council there is the universal ordinary magisterium and these two are under the Petrine charism okay and the universal ordinary magisterium is whenever the church speaks in unison on any issue relating to faith and morals that she is always, quote, taught in unison on it, which, by the way, there's no list of these. That's why it's up to every individual Catholic's interpretation. And the third category is the ordinary teaching, which is not universal, but is the normative ordinary teaching of the papacy or the pope or the whole of the, of the church. Now, you're supposed to submit with docility to the ordinary teaching, even if you believe it's wrong. And that includes encyclicals. Encyclicals are part of the ordinary teaching, and they may also be, depending upon what they're discussing and their scope and who they're written to, they may also follow under universal ordinary magisterium and thus be given the Petrine charism and protection of infallibility and inerrancy. And encyclicals might also have ex cathedra statements in them so this is how the roman catholic structure works that's not me making it up by the way you can find uh, other roman catholics who will tell you this like uh recent roman catholic doubter threatening to leave the church steve skajic or whatever his name was who we reached out to in a, in a nice and friendly way and his response was to basically uh, brushed me off as a loon or something. I don't remember what he said, but uh, reached out in a, in a nice, friendly way. Talked to, try to talk to Steve Skajic, Skajic, Skojic, whatever his name is. Uh, he wasn't having it. So uh, here it is. So here's Steve's article, the uh, Magisterium of Cheat Sheet over at the 1 Peter 5 that they all love, right? And 1 Peter 5's article goes into, which we've 
talked about a million times. Cheat sheet for the magisterium. And you'll find it saying everything that I say because it's not that mysterious and hard to figure out. Now, what actual doctrines are part of the ex cathedra statements? That is anybody's guess. And every different Roman Catholic will have a different list as to what fits in the infallible and non-infallible bins. Okay, Every individual Roman Catholic will, uh, according to their fancy, throw in the infallible bin what they pick and what they want and throw in the non-infallible bin all the stuff they don't like. They all do that. So notice how useless this criteria and gradation standard is. It doesn't actually tell you as an individual Catholic which doctrines are what. So you have to go interpret it. Well, I thought the papacy was going to solve these interpretation problems for me. I thought it was going to get me out of the box of disputes and division and disunity. And yet the Roman Catholic Church, like no time ever before, is completely a gigantic, divided, scandalous mess. What better proof and attestation against their practical argument for the papacy because they hinge 80 to 90 percent of their apologetic on the practical solutions of the papacy providing unity what better argument against that than the existing fruits of that rotten tree now i don't think roman catholics are rotten people on the whole i am not against individual roman catholics i do not accept or believe in their papacy and the system okay that's what i'm against so don't get mad if you're a roman catholic not hating on you. It's nothing to do with hating any. I want to see Roman Catholics discover authentic Catholicism, aka Orthodoxy. That's what we're trying to do here. So here is this uh, uh, Ubi uh, interview that we did that was really good, getting into a lot of depth on papal quote minds. But uh, let's get back to, to this rebuttal. But I wanted to, to make it very clear. I'm glad we found that quote because notice the quote says the very opposite of what Trent says it says. Okay, why didn't Trent put the quote up of what Francis actually said about the death penalty? No, he just tells you what Francis means. Now, wait a minute. Why do we need Trent's interpretation of Francis? I thought the purpose of the papacy was so that we had a, an interpretation that would guide us in the miasma. Oh, no, but you see, the way Roman Catholicism really works is that every Roman Catholic has an interpretation of the interpretation of the interpretation. I'm not joking. That's how it works. The, the Pope never declared the death penalty to be intrinsically evil. Uh, how about barbaric, uh, inadmissible, and against the gospel? Uh, I would say against the gospel is pretty much intrinsically evil, don't you think? Only that it shouldn't be used anymore. Another option, though, is to say that the teach. Okay, so it's not natural justice? Or are you just giving us all of the cope options? So he's trying to give us a list of cope options? Again, Trent, why do we need varying interpretations of Francis's decision on the on the death penalty? Your 80 percent, 90 percent of these people's argument is that the papacy solves these problems. And here we have Trent giving us a variety of interpretations of Francis's actions against the death penalty and statements against it. I mean, this is just ludicrous. This itself shows that this system doesn't work. Saying that the death penalty is moral was never infallibly defined uh, previously in the church's history. Uh, it doesn't have to be infallibly defined if it's part of natural law. No, notice the stupidity of these people's position that anything that comes up, even moral law and natural law, I only have to accept it if it's infallibly defined. No, you have to accept moral law. Do you think that you need a, a an ex cathedra statement to tell you the Ten Commandments? They probably do. Like, they probably literally think that you don't even know natural law or moral law, which their system says you do know inherently. Oh, but now we need an ex cathedra statement to know what the Ten Commandments and moral law and natural law are. I mean, this is just look at the absurdity of this position. Even though it was a long standing practice. So, as a result, it was not just a practice, it was a practice based on the principles of natural law and natural justice, the very thing that you debated me on. You debated me on natural law and natural justice, which you confused about five different times with five different things. But here when we talk about natural law and moral law and natural justice, you require a papal ex-cathedra statement 
for the death penalty. It doesn't have anything to do with infallibility. It's a change in morals. I thought the Roman Catholic Church doesn't evolve or change in its morals. Don't you guys make this argument about contraception and abortion? I thought you hinged quite a bit on the fact that the morals of the Roman Catholic Church will never allow abortion and contraception. Oh, but you see, the practice of the death penalty doesn't count. It can evolve. It can go away. It's no longer natural justice because Frank says so. This social doctrine can be applied in different ways throughout church history in the best way to be able to serve. So wait a minute. So is it natural justice or not? Right. That's the question here. And that was what I argued in the essay. Right. I said my critique, which is very precise. I'll give you the critique right here. See the original article. Yeah, here it is. So uh, in my original article, I go after the death penalty. I think it's the uh, it's the second thing I go after. Yeah. So here's my long essay that uh, the video is kind of referring to. If you want this, guys, uh, here's the long essay right there. The essay is called uh, Five Simple Arguments Against the Papacy," and I go into. Um, the argument on the basis of natural law and natural justice. Okay? It's not just a question of uh, what is the dogmatic status of the death penalty. It doesn't have anything to do with dogma. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing to me that, like, what does this have to do with your dogmas when it's about natural law? Of the common good. So in practice, this would make the death penalty sort of like slavery, in that the Bible and the church allowed this practice in the past for a broad range of reasons to prevent greater evils from arising. And then as time went on. So wait a minute. Is it natural justice or is it an evil? Because you just conflated the principle of owning people with the principle of natural justice via the death penalty, which your church used to say was just. So again, total false analogy to compare it to the practice of owning and trading human beings. This practice was not allowed, and it was restricted to promote the common good. So that's what we could say with slavery, something that was allowed to prevent even worse evils like starvation, for example. But now in the modern age, we do not tolerate slavery anymore. The death penalty was allowed uh, in the past for a broad range of reasons, heresy, even crimes like theft, to promote the common good. Then it be, was allowed for fewer and fewer cases up into the modern age, only for very, very serious crimes like murder. And now saying that it's not allowed for any crimes. So, yeah, so which one is it, Trent? Is it just or is it not just? You see the point here? As I said, you could pick either view of what makes the most sense to you. And not Wait a minute. Why, why do we have to pick views as to how we interpret Francis's clear contradictions here? Did everybody notice the cope, right? Francis, clear as day, contradicts the centuries and centuries of practice of the Latin Roman Catholic Church in regard to the death penalty. And the answer of Trent is, here's three or four different options and ways you, you can interpret Francis. The interpretation of the interpretation. Either one contradicts the teaching that the Pope is infallible or that the church isn't. It doesn't have anything to do with infallibility. It has to do with the infectability, indefectibility of the Roman see and changing the teaching of your church. So again, conflating the issues, totally deflected, didn't answer it. Fallible. But I will say that Dyer's objection, his concern about moral flip-flops, it actually cuts against Eastern Orthodoxy in a more severe way, in a more substantive and immediate way <laughs> when we look at the issue of contraception. Look at Callisto's way. He doesn't cite anything other than Timothy Ware's lame book, right? Um, so no real familiarity with uh, Orthodox theology on these issues. And so that's why Ubi thankfully did this excellent video, uh, which we will share, rebutting this specific issue. Because we, of course, uh, Roman Catholics love to go and run to the contraception issue. Now, wait a minute. Uh, is this really... Uh, a problem for the for the Orthodox is this really a thing where we change positions so notice 
that in a clear example of Francis and John Paul II rejecting and calling the death penalty against the gospel, I would say that's a change. What's Trent's answer? You guys don't have a clear statement on contraception. Actually, we do. And there is Ubi's reply. And there's also a great interview with Dr. David Bradshaw, who has a great essay on this issue, actually showing the contradictions of the Roman Catholic position. Now, in the Orthodox view, we don't have the same legalism attitude. We don't have the same attitudes towards these issues in terms of uh, everything being this black and white thing like Roman Catholics claim to do. They claim to have this high moral stance. But do they really? In fact, they do not. In fact, what they do is produce gigantic numbers of hypocrites with their annulment doctrine, which everyone knows is just Roman Catholic divorce, and with their natural family planning doctrine, which is just another version of birth control. So it's not actually the case that they have this high, high moral position above and better than everyone else that they always hang everything on. And his arguments against our position don't even work if you watch Dr. David Bradshaw's critique of Thomism and their inconsistencies, by the way, on the medieval view of thinking that fetuses don't have life until, I forget what, several weeks, right? Uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good amount of time. I forget the exact view, but uh, I didn't even know this, actually, that, that this was something that medieval theologians and Probably the papacy, I'm not 100% sure if the papacy had a position on uh, fetuses, quote, being alive uh, way after a certain date after conception. Um, but it was a pretty common view in the Middle Ages. Uh, so my point being is that, wait a minute, uh, so who's inconsistent here really, right? I mean, if you guys have, have evolved your positions, if natural family planning is something that Pius Twelfth later says you can do, well, how come some trads point out that Natural family planning is an accepting of birth control. Oh, but it's not an artificial means. Okay, so you just invent another category to where, oh, well, uh, it's okay because it's not artificial. Okay, so but knowing uh, a woman's cycle and avoiding the times when she's most likely to be pregnant, that is artificial, dummy. It's the same thing. It's just not using a chemical. All right. So again, it's all casuistry is what this is called, where you come up with a bunch of legalities and uh, specificity and scholastic definitions to get around the actual heart of the moral issue. And are you actually hypocritical on these issues? Now, notice, again, he says that this reflects against the orthodox view. But the argument, what our argument, it, my church doesn't hinge on one dude. So again, the reason we keep going to the papacy is because he hinges his position on one dude, one C, and the teachings and actions of, the, of that C. And it doesn't matter so much about infallibility of the Roman C, because they will always deflect and they will always say, whenever there's a problem, it wasn't infallible, it wasn't infallible, it wasn't infallible, it wasn't ex cathedra. It's never ex cathedra until they need it to be. And that's why it's much easier for our, our apologetic purposes to focus on indefectibility. Now, wait a minute. Because your position isn't just that the Pope is infallible in his ex cathedra and universal ordinary teaching. It's also that he cannot defect from the faith. So what constitutes defection in the Roman Catholic faith? Well, going against the morals of the church and the natural law teaching of the church probably counts as a defection. I mean, if a person in the Roman Catholic Church accepts, for example, abrasion, your canon law says that they are ipso facto excommunicated. So that's going against the moral understanding, the classic moral teachings, and it's something that automatically ipso facto latte sententia excommunicates you, meaning that it doesn't require clerical exposition or statement. It's automatic. Well, I would say that changing the morals of the church probably also counts as that, wouldn't you? And observe Trent's wild talking around of the issue of Francis on the death penalty. Trent said, you have a variety of ways that you can interpret this and what you do and do not have to accept. No, you don't. And he didn't. And Trent did not give you the actual statement of Francis. Francis said it is against the gospel. Trent said, Francis didn't say you don't have to do it. 
Yes, he did. Dishonesty or ignorance. He's a very famous Orthodox metropolitan and author. In the 1963 edition of his book, The Orthodox Church, it says, artificial methods of contraception are forbidden in the Orthodox Church. This follows a 1937 encyclical from the Greek Orthodox Church that only allowed abstinence for married couples to space births. But after contraception became popular, you see things change in the Orthodox Church. Father John Meyendorf, in his 1975 book, Marriage and Orthodox Perspective, writes, The question of birth control and of its acceptable forms can only be solved by individual Christian couples. The 1984 version of Ware's book says, The use of contraceptives and other devices for birth control is on the whole strongly discouraged in the Orthodox Church. Some bishops and theologians altogether condemn the employment of such methods. Others, however, have recently begun to adopt a less strict position and urge that the question is best left to the discretion of each individual couple in consultation with the spiritual father. By 1992, the Orthodox Church of America hosted a synod which said, In all the difficult decisions involving the practice of birth control, Orthodox families must live under the guidance of the pastors of the church. So, in other words, uh, citing various theologians of the Orthodox Church pointing out economia doesn't prove that there's liberalism or everything goes in our system. So, our view of economia is rooted in the local church and the person being under their spiritual father and getting this kind of guidance. And so your system is predicated on one person in Rome dictating to everybody how it's supposed to be. And the problem with that system isn't that there's a bad desire. I think for a lot of Roman Catholics, the desire to have correct morals and correct living is there. And I don't fault them for that. The problem is the attempt to have a super rigid trad morality where there's a black and white answer to every single situation. And what that has done in the Roman Catholic world is that it created this rigidity that led to the extreme opposite reaction in the post-Vatican II world. So now in the Roman Catholic world, there is a fissure between the acceptance of anything goes, including all of the Skittles things, at least in a large part amongst the priests in the Roman Catholic Church, versus the minority, small sort of trad world where there's the attempt to try to bring everything back to the Tridentine pre-Vatican two times. So you have this extreme in the so-called Catholic world. This group of trads, they don't think these people over here are even Catholic most of the time. These people over here think these people are nuts and rigorous and crazy. So that's the the pendulum swing of this world of, of, of trad and normal Catholic, quote unquote. And so that itself, I think, shows that this problem isn't going to be solved by appealing to uh, various theologians in different churches. I mean, I could pick James Martin, right? Francis's favorite Skittles Jesuit. Okay. Uh, if I if I ran through a, a, a bunch of uh, Cardinal Daniels and uh, uh, Angelo Roncalli and I could I could list all kinds of different people right John the twenty third and, and and all kinds of theologians Skillebex right Hans Kuhn do they represent the mind of your church Okay well so does Timothy Ware de facto does a statement from the OCA No. Because you understand our church is decentralized. They, they just can't figure this out, right? That it's decentralized. And we don't have, I don't have a problem saying that, that, that uh, Timothy Ware got things wrong. There's several places in Timothy Ware's book where he gets things, especially his Orthodox way book. He makes an historian statement. I don't have a problem saying that Timothy Ware's wrong. Do you have a problem saying that James Martin's wrong? No. Okay. So what does this have to do with which church is right? Okay, well, it doesn't really have anything to do with it because neither of these systems are going to be proven by citing this or that fallible theologian. So we're going to have to look at the systems and the paradigms themselves. And whose system is built on one dude and one action and his that one dude's actions and teachings? Okay, not mine. So do you understand that I will not be susceptible to the same problems and critiques that your system is susceptible to? And the issue with this is nuanced 
And it gets into how we don't have the same view of natural law as you do. That's Dr. Bradshaw's whole paper on this, which is really good. And so I'm going to have to tell you guys, if you want to get deep into this, go watch Ubi's video. He deals with it in an excellent scholarly way. And he goes all the way back to church history and proves and shows that this is not some just easy uh, moral gotcha. I mean, they love these moral gotchas. And I think that's what's so sort of annoying about the Roman Catholics is how much they love the moral gotchas. As if we're going to be convinced of the of your church on the basis of moral gotchas when it's predicated on the papacy. It all comes down to, to Francis. By your own admission, by your own church's teachings, it really comes down to Francis. My system doesn't come down to what Timothy Ware says. Okay, I, I can dismiss and I can hand wave. You guys can't hand wave Francis or Vatican II. I can hand wave. Because I don't have to listen to what Timothy Ware says. Church and ask daily for the mercy and forgiveness of God. And the next year, in 1993, Callistos Ware's book on the Orthodox Church said, Concerning contraceptives and other forms of birth control, differing opinions exist within the Orthodox Church. world uh, in the Roman Catholic world we don't have differences of opinions so he's trying to sell it as if this is not a problem in their church uh, again I just showed you that Francis says that the death penalty is against the gospel and no longer admissible and Trent is trying to sell you that we don't change our morals look at contraception again it's fraud in the past birth control was in general strongly condemned but today, a less. By the way, I have to go wee wee, so uh, I'm gonna let Trent play a little bit uh, while I go to the boys' room. View is coming to prevail, not only in the West, but in traditional Orthodox countries. Of course, there are more conservative Orthodox priests and patriarchs who believe contraception is always sinful. But the problem remains, though, in that there is no universal magisterium among all of the Eastern Orthodox churches to help people know which bishops or patriarchs, metropolitans are correct on contraception and which are not. Without such an authority, everybody's free to decide what constitutes sacred tradition on this matter. And so in practice, you get something that looks like ancient Eastern Christianity, but feels like modern Western Protestantism. Vatican I is very clear about that. Canon law is very clear about that. You have to follow the not just the extraordinary teaching, but also the universal ordinary teaching of the papacy. That's made very clear in Vatican I. And in fact, it's a condemned proposition, and we showed as we showed in our last article, that you only have to follow the extraordinary uh, infallible teachings and not the universal ordinary teachings. That's actually a condemned proposition. Dyer is correct. We aren't obligated to follow only what is taught as dogma or only what is infallibly defined. We also have to give what is called religious submission of mind and will to what the church teaches. Now, this is an important point. So he's admitting, right, this point that we hammer home all the time. So keep in mind. So here Trent is admitting my central point when it comes to what's necessary in Vatican I beyond just the ex cathedra teachings. Is in the ordinary magisterium or what it teaches in a non definitive way that could continue to develop. For example, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception wasn't formally or infallibly defined until 1854, but it was part of the ordinary magisterium for centuries before that point. The difference is that religious submission of mind and will requires us at minimum to not publicly object to a doctrine or lead people in rebellion against it. Uh, we could personally struggle with these doctrines and still not commit a grave sin. <laughs> but dogmas, those things which... Yeah. Uh, saying that the death penalty is against the gospel? Is that, was that be, would that be something you struggle with, or what do you think there, Trent? The church infallibly defines as being a part of divine revelation. What about uh, Pachamama? Is that something we struggle with, or is that like, is it, should we submit to that, or like, how does that work? Must be believed. If a person rejects these teachings, then they commit a grave sin. I'll leave a link in the...
traditional Roman Catholic uh, systematic theology, right? Does this constitute Catholic dogma? Well, not really. I mean, it's a fallible theologian writing about the dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church, but it's not itself dogmatic. However, there's other things that we can point to where we might find the dogmas of the Catholic Church. For example, maybe the sources of dogma. <laughs> Would that count? Uh, okay, so here's Denzinger, right? This famous treatment of all of the so-called papal approval documents, everything approved by the Roman See from the time of the apostolic period up to Vatican, prior to Vatican II. So Heinrich Denzinger uh, sourced this, right? up until the time of Vatican II. And as you guys know, this is the normative source that the Vatican itself cites. Okay, so Vatican documents will cite Denzinger. Now, Denzinger is one of various sources of dogma just for papally approved things. This is, let's see, what? 700 pages. We'll say 700 pages on Denzinger. Okay, now the Catechism of the Catholic Church includes ordinary teaching, universal ordinary teaching and extraordinary teaching it's also approved for the entire church with the full authority of the apostolic see so we can include the catechism under the normative dogmatic teaching authority of the church even if not every single paragraph in the catechism is necessarily infallible so the catechism however does constitute dogma so here we have another let's see what this one is 759 pages what about the documents of vatican ii well i have the entire uh, selection here from austin o'flannery and his translation of the entire collection of the documents of vatican ii now these have kind of varying i guess you could say levels of authority amongst them but how wait a minute this is just one ecumenical council that's mm, 600 pages so vatican ii's documents 600 pages now we're just looking at a couple Okay, we're at, uh, what's uh, 1,300, 1,400 pages so far, okay? This is a famous set that I bought many years ago. It's kind of expensive. It's the Tanner and Alberigo $200 ecumenical council set. It's the decrees of the ecumenical council that's the sort of normative, authoritative, scholarly treatment for the Roman Catholic Church, for the ecumenical councils. Do you see that? Okay. This is another, mm, and it, it does include Vatican II. So uh, it's another 1,200 pages for both of these. So we'll put, we'll add that. Um, what else constitutes? Uh, do you see? Well, you can't see it. Over in the corner, I have a giant stack of encyclicals, papal encyclicals, a big old stack of them. Let me see if I can grab them. Now, these are just some of the more recent encyclicals of the 20th century. Okay, there's no, I don't think there's any old, old encyclicals in here, right? Here's another stack of, I don't know, four or 500 pages of encyclicals, okay? Now, here we are making our way. This is uh, just a smattering, not all of them, but just a smattering of Roman Catholic dogma. How, what do you think of this? Is this... Okay, D does this count as dogmatics in the Roman Catholic Church? I think so. I don't think that's even controversial, right? This gigantic stack. Now, <clears throat> Trent is laying out the criteria for knowing what the infallible teachings are out of this slice of Catholic dogmatic statements. Again, this is not exhaustive. I don't have all of the Catholic dogmatic documents here. So are you beginning to see the problem with this? Wait a minute. So I'm given a couple criteria. What are my criteria? Well, let's go back over here to Steve Skojic's helpful list. Where is it at? I've lost my Steve list. Where is it at? Did I exit out? Uh, let me see. I guess I'll have to pull it back up. No, here it is. No, that's not it. Oh, here we go. So in uh, Steve's helpful cheat list, we have what 
Trent is going to tell us is the basic criteria. So let's look at a few of these definitions from the cheat sheet. Hopefully none of this is controversial. Of course, they'll always just wrangle on forever and ever and ever. It's saying, oh, that's not correctly. That's not technically correct. Magisterium is the teaching of the office of the Pope or the bishops in union with the Pope. Extraordinary is the non-ordinary solemn teaching. In other words, ex-cathedra or ecumenical councils that are approved by the papacy. Ordinary magisterium is part of the regular teaching duties of the church. Universal ordinary magisterium is what's taught by the entire church. Infallible doctrines are irreformable and cannot err and cannot change. Non-infallible are other things that are able to be false, which Steve argues, or whoever wrote this, is very rare. Interesting. Very rare. So uh, that kind of speaks against the idea that I can reject any of the things that I don't think are infallible, right? As many Roman Catholics tend to say. All right, let's get down here. So manner and quality of the proposal. Infallible in every instance if it's extraordinary ecumenical councils and papacy. Yep, I just said that. Ordinary universal magisterium, Pope alone or reaffirming previous doctrines or the bishops in communion with the Pope all teaching unanim- uh, unanimously the same thing. Okay, now let's wait a minute here. So we've been given a few general criteria for the categories and it kind of makes sense on the face of it. Oh, okay, so there's... Uh, the extraordinary things, because they don't often happen, ex cathedra statements and ecumenical councils. I can see why they would be extraordinary because they don't happen a lot. Okay, yeah, it makes sense, right? See how simple Roman Catholicism is? It's just so clear and simple. Then we have the universal ordinary teaching, which might not be dealing specifically with an ex cathedra statement or an ecumenical council, but it might be reaffirming something that the church has, quote, always taught. Okay. Uh, what are those things? Well, it's the things the church always taught. Okay, isn't that kind of begging the question? I'm asking you, where's the list? Remember, what do they always do? Where's the Orthodox teaching on this? Where's the list of the dogmas? Okay, now wait a minute. Do you have a list? Yes, we do. Look at this giant stack of books. Here's the list of the... I got a list. But wait a minute. Not everything in this stack is dogma, is it? Okay, so we've got what conservatively, we got conservatively here, we'll say uh, 4,000, 5,000 pages of documents here, okay? So out of this 4,000 pages, is everything in this dogma? Uh, Well, no, but a lot of it is. Oh, oh, a lot of it. Where, 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 how do I put what into what bin? Oh, you see, uh, you go and you study and you get a THD and you study under, uh, you know, Christendom University professors. And then they send you to the Gregorium in Rome and then you study there and you come back and then you blah, blah, blah. And so you see, this doesn't answer the question. All I've been given is super generic criteria about a couple categories that are supposed to classify all of this for me. And now as an individual Catholic, I'm supposed to be able to, on the basis of these generic criteria, filter out of this giant stack what goes into what bin. Now, is it not obvious to you people that there's an epistemic problem here? How do I know that I'm sorting out the giant stack of boring shit here into the right bins? I don't, you see, because I'm not, quote, infallible. In their system, none of them are, except Frank. So what ought to happen is, Frank ought to sift through this and tell me what the right interpretation of this big boring stack is. Oh, wait a minute. That's what they claim he does, don't they? That's exactly his role in his office, is to sift through the piles of boring shit to tell us what is the infallible and the non-infallible and the true, the false, the moral compass, isn't he? Oh, but wait a minute. He doesn't do this, does he? No, he doesn't. There's no place where the Roman Catholic Church sifts out for you what is infallible and what's not infallible. They leave it to you, and now it's a haven of idiots debating for centuries, and they can't tell you. There's no list. They don't know. They just hammer this at you. You don't have a magisterium. It's not infallible. You don't have a list. Where's your list? 
well, uh, we will, uh, 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 we go to the, uh, first of all, we make a list of the uh, infallible statements, which are ex cathedra, which be, can be proven by looking at the manuals of blah, blah, blah. Then they, they don't know. It's just bullshit. Right? And you, why is he saying a cuss word? Because it's a deception that is deceiving millions of people. That's why. And no matter how many horrendous PEDO cult stuff comes out, these people voraciously defend this office as if this guy has any interest in any of you trads. Your worst enemy is the dude you spend your life defending, dummies. And this drives them into a rage. That's why I have to hire, I hire private security for my event. Because these crazy trads, and there's no telling what they'll do. So trads, if you're going to come after me, I've got, I'm not joking, I've hired private security for the event. Because this throws them into a rage. And it's not even that difficult of an argument that we're making. And if we had all just kept this in the domain of argumentation, that would be fine. Did they do that? No. They go after you privately. They go after your relations they go after who you are married to i mean it's nasty these people are nasty they try to get you deplatformed they try they do everything that they say is mean in the background they're doing it michael lofton sending his lawsuit threat to me because i made jokes about him are you serious description below to articles by my friend Jimmy Aiken that talks about how to oh you mean Jimmy Aiken who says that Nestorius wasn't a heretic dude I'm gonna tell you right now uh I like Trent on a personal level these people are idiots and that's not me being mean this is low tier low quality pop apologetics way church teachings and understand the different levels of authority behind them okay Trent, where in the different levels do I know for sure that I'm putting them into the right bins? This is a very simple epistemological question. If you remember in the debate, when I debated with Trent, did Trent even know basic epistemology? No, he didn't. It was amazing. He was flundered, flustered, and contradicted multiple times. On the one hand, saying that he's not a foundationalist, but he is a foundationalist. And he doesn't believe in circular arguments, but Descartes' cogito works because it's self-referential. I mean, it's like whole other level, dude. So um, the next point I would say that is problematic for just the papacy itself, uh, as I listed in my article, is that it is a power that grew to include temporal dominion. Uh, this is brought to the forefront of Metropolitan Seraphim and Piraeus' uh, excellent essay letter that's about 80 or 90 pages that he wrote to Francis the Orthodox Bishop who wrote to Francis uh, when Francis was elected. And this is the idea that uh, no longer was it a, a, a spiritual power, but by the time of, say, uh, Unum Sanctum, you have this idea that the Pope is actually over every uh, 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 temporal authority as well, and he has the right to depose and pronounce, you know, basically in the civil sphere anything he wants. And that in order to be saved, every human creature must be subject to the Roman pontiff, not just spiritually, but also in a temporal sense. And uh, this, of course, corresponds to the third temptation, or to the temptation, the three temptations of Christ, right? One of those being the, to be given dominion over the entire world. Uh, and St. Justin Popovich has a great critique of this in his, in his book, Orthodox Faith and Life in Christ. I think Dyer would agree with us that if Christ established a church to guide us to salvation— then to be saved, we must be united to that church. Dyer's main concern is that the 14th century bull Unum Sanctum also seems to say that to be saved, every human being must be subject to the Pope as a... It doesn't seem to say that. It does say that. ...temporal ruler, or an earthly political ruler also. But the essence of this bull is that the secular order should take cues from the spiritual order. Yeah, so now uh, we need Trent's interpretation to give us the essence of the bull, not the actual text of the bull, which says that it is necessary for every human being in the world to be subject to the Roman pontiff, and it also does affirm the universal temporal God status of the Pope. 
And how was this doctrine proven and propped up, which was dogmatic, clearly, in that encyclical Unum Sanctum, right? How was it proven? How, on what basis did the Roman Catholic Church historically prove this ludicrous doctrine? Oh, the forgeries, exactly right, like the donation of Constantine, as well as countless other forgeries. And you can go to these forgeries that we saw deconstructed so eloquently by Ubi. Ubi did an entire documentary deconstructing the forgeries what what if you if the roman catholic papacy had the goods as we're told by trent and so many others why did it require so many forgeries to prop this up again go watch ubi's forgeries and cyclicals why does the catechism of trent cite forgeries did you know that it still cites? I mean, I don't guess they're going to delete the Catechism of Trent, but the Catechism of Trent cites the Isidorian Decretals, which are the pseudo-Isidorian Decretals. Uh, not in one place, but in many places. Oh, so wait a minute. So the, the Roman Catholic papacy, the See of Peter, guided by the Holy Spirit in its charism, apparently the Holy Spirit didn't tell him what were forgeries. I would have thought that giving, you know, having the power of the Holy Spirit, you might be able to detect forgeries, especially if Jesus gave us this office to guide us and keep us from error. But they couldn't detect forgeries, apparently, because they cited for centuries into the Catechism of Trent, citing the Isidorian Decretals, which are forgeries. How come your papacy didn't see the forgeries? Not the other way around. This was especially the case in the Middle Ages, when secular kings often took it upon themselves to appoint people to spiritual offices, like saying, who's going to be the bishop? Oh, you mean how the papacy did this? How there were many Roman Catholic cardinals who were also warriors? Are you, are you familiar with this? Did you know that the ancient canons in the councils forbid clerics to have public state office? So it is the Roman Catholic Church which first violates in the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages, the ancient canons which forbid clerics from having state offices. What does the Pope do but declare himself the ultimate state ruler, violating the ancient canons that forbid clerics to be in office? In that sense, even Dyer would agree that the Church should have a say in how secular governments carry out basic moral principles. Yeah, but this was the Symphonia doctrine of the Ecumenical Council. So if you read the Seventh Ecumenical Council, you'll notice that there's a dialogue between the God-ordained emperor and the bishops assembled at the council. So that's called Symphonia. That's the two-headed Byzantine eagle. That is not the papal doctrine of a single-headed eagle of the pope with the church and the state as his body. It's the Byzantine symphonia of a double-headed eagle. That's the ancient Orthodox Catholic symbol of the church. So they don't even know that that's actually the Orthodox view, right? That that, uh, that symbol is an Orthodox symbol. The Catholic Encyclopedia puts it this way. From these authorities and from declarations made by Boniface VIII himself, the author of Unum Sanctum, it is also evident that the jurisdiction of the spiritual power over the secular has for its basis the concept of the Church as guardian of the Christian law of morals. Hence, her jurisdiction extends as far as this law is concerned. Consequently, when King Philip protested, Clement V was able, in his brief Meru of February 1st, 1306, to declare that the French king in France were to suffer no disadvantage on account of the bull Unum Sanctum and that the issuing of this bull had not made them subject to the authority of the Roman Church in any other manner than formerly. In this way, Pope Clement V was able to give France and its ruler a guarantee of security from the ecclesiastico-political results of the opinions elaborated in the bull, while its dogmatic decision suffered no detriment of any kind. So basically what Unum Sanctum said was that the secular order should take cues from the spiritual order, uh, it says to be saved, you have to be submitted to the Roman pontiff and also to the temporal uh, authority and power of the Roman pontiff. So he didn't even read what Unum Sanctum actually says. And by the way, he didn't read what uh, Francis actually says about the death penalty. So uh, all of this is, is basically Trent spin. 
Okay, there's no actual sourcing of documents, but who cares what the Clement uh, the Fifth thinks about uh, the bull? That's not the point. The point is the papal documents and what they say because they're binding. Not what Clement thinks. Who cares what he thinks? And who cares that he's making the argument that, well, it was already kind of believed anyway prior to the bull being stated. Okay, but the bull actually says it is necessary for the salvation of every creature not only to be subject to the Roman pontiff in matters, matters spiritual, but also in matters temporal. That is the papacy violating the ancient canons, setting itself up as a state power and authority. And nobody, there's nobody that doubts this is what happened in the history of the church. Does anybody think that in the first century, the Roman church was a state power? Now, the, I don't know if you trads don't know this, but there's forgeries, okay? Did you know that the donation of Constantine was a forgery? I see trads still citing these things as if they're legit, right? I mean, you get trads that are so crazy. They'll cite the Catechism of Trent and the forgeries. Not, they don't even know there's forgeries. That kings and secular rulers do not get to decide things like the moral law. God does that. and he's. Oh, wait a minute. I thought the Pope tells us moral law, according to what you said a few minutes ago about the death penalty. But now you're saying, no, God tells us the moral law, not the state rulers. Well, if God tells us the moral law, then why do we need the papacy to uh, tell us what the proper uh, interpretation of the death penalty is, Trent? Even as a church to be able to understand that, and even kings should look to the church when it comes to these important truths. Where he, he compares this to uh, the temptation of Satan. Uh, Grand Inquisitor chapter of Dostoevsky compares it to the temptation. Uh, and along with that, what, what has historically helped to prop up the temporal authority of the Roman see, uh, and it's basically God emperor status in the civil sphere, as well as the spiritual realm were a bunch of forgeries, the donation of Constantine, uh, the pseudo Ambrose writings, the Samachian forgeries, the pseudo Isidorian decretals, the Gratian decretals, uh, texts like the errors of the Greeks that Aquinas relied on, which are all now admitted and known forgeries. Even the Vatican itself admits that all these documents are essentially later forgeries. Well, for centuries, those were used to prop up uh, the the authority of the Pope in the temporal sphere, among other things. Right, Dictatus Pape is another one of these great uh, ridiculous documents, which are no longer appealed to by the Vatican itself. Hence the uh, scandal and double think of the. Uh, Roman Catholic traditionalist world, right? Trying to reconcile these centuries, these millennia of these, the last millennia of claims of just extensive, uh, insane levels of power that have now been discarded uh, under the cloak of humility on the part of the Vatican II popes. I agree that some political claims made by popes throughout church history, claims to temporal power, were based on forged documents. Some of them... So, uh, at least he's willing to admit this, okay? I mean, <laughs> it's not just some. It's like the essence of this dumb doctrine was propped up by these ridiculous forgeries. So, he's trying to minimize again what is something that's obviously preposterous, right? Really difficult for them to defend. And says, so, uh, well, it's just, you know, some, some of these things were... For no, no, no. The essence of this dumb doctrine was forgeries okay not just some famous forgeries again go watch ubi's excellent documentary that he made on these forgeries okay it's not this also is, is not rocket science again if you guys have the goods if this was so clear and obvious what does vatican one say what does satis cognitum of leo the 13th say everybody in all age in, in every age at every point knew that the Roman Catholic See had all the primacy, all the claims, all the jurists. Everybody knew this. Oh, but wait, we gotta we gotta prop it up with ridiculous forgeries for centuries, like twenty four of them, right? Like literally, like twenty four forgeries, okay, of famous documents. We did a whole live stream with Snack covering all of the forgeries. And the Roman Catholic just spurging out because one of the documents uh, wasn't used. Okay, so okay, so you, one of the twenty-four uh, wasn't a forgery. That it was still a forgery, but it wasn't used to, to prop up the papacy. Okay, good job. Yeah, way to refute the argument, right? 
I mean, it, unbelievable. Based on things like the donation of Constantine, a forgery that was attributed to Emperor Constantine in ancient Rome. Which your church used for centuries to prop up your papal supremacy. Okay, so let's be clear w what it actually was. Claiming to give temporal power to the papacy. But the later dogmatic definitions of the papacy, like we have at Vatican I, were not based on that in any form. It doesn't matter because it was assumed that it was true, right? So in other words, the doctrine of papal supremacy is assumed to be true on the basis of the documents and the documents are forgeries. The doctrine still is assumed to be true. Okay. So it's not true. Trent is wrong when he says that things like Unum Sanctum were true apart from the forgeries. No, they weren't. There might have been, they would appeal to, it's not the only thing they appealed to, but it was part of the basis of the doctrine. So that's not true. Again, the Catechism of Trent cites the pseudo-Isidorian decretals, which are admitted forgeries, to argue some of their papal polemics. So he's wrong about that. In fact, we knew that things like the donation of Constantine were forgeries centuries before Vatican I's teaching on the papacy. And finding out that... Okay, so what does that prove? Again, <laughs> the fact that you knew that the donation of Constantine was a forgery has nothing to do with whether at Trent they were citing the pseudo isidorian decretals, which are forgeries. Evidence you thought was reliable is actually a forgery. That's not just a Catholic problem. For example, Eastern Orthodox apologists. Here we go with the, you have that problem too, but uh, my church isn't built on one dude. I don't claim for one see or one patriarchate infallibility or indefectibility. If I thought that the Patriarch of Constantinople was infallible and then he started propping, propping up the uh, Patriarch of Constantinople with forgeries, which by the way, you could argue that uh, he's almost halfway doing that. Uh, guess what? He's wrong. And that has nothing to do with refuting orthodoxy because my system isn't built on one dude. I, I just can't understand why these people can't understand basic arguments. I mean, it's not that difficult to understand that my system isn't built on one dude. So if I critique your system, which is built on one dude and his actions and his teachings and it falls apart, it is not a sufficient rebuttal for you to say, yeah, but you have a problem too. Yeah, but you have these problems. You have this problem. You have a bishop who's liberal. You have a bishop who's a heretic. My, my system's not built on one dude. Like, how can you not see this? Are you guys this slow? Like, are, are, what's in the wafers that you're eating? Is it gluten? Like, what's the problem? Why can't you understand? Have sometimes quoted letters from St. Basil the Great defending the use of icons that turned out to be forgeries. They weren't written by St. Basil at all. But my dogmas in my church are not built on any forgeries. Okay, I don't have any dogmas built on forgeries. The doctrine of the supremacy of the Pope in temporal matters was built on forgeries. But the existence of those forgeries does not refute the genuine evidence you have in favor of iconography. Another example would be apocryphal or forged gospels that claim to be the gospel according to Peter or the gospel according to Philip. The existence of these forgeries that some people in church history might have taken as legitimate does not refute the existence of genuine evidence for the Gospels. Yeah, but again, that is a deflection from, it's a false analogy to what the argument was about, which was about the dogmatic proof for the temporal supremacy of the Pope. And when Unum Sanctum and doctrines like uh, documents like that made that argument, they were citing documents that were forgeries. So that's a false analogy to what Trent is saying, because, I mean, the analogy would work if I said the, uh, the Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity is proven by uh, this uh, pseudo-Athanasius. I mean, do you not, that would be the form of the argument that you're critiquing to apply it to me. Is that, is that what I, did we make this argument? <laughs> I mean, it's like, that is your argument. Okay. Your argument is that Unum Sanctum is true. It's a dogmatic teaching of the Pope. And they did base their argument on forgeries, as does the Catechism of Trent, Trent. And the same is true of the papacy. The existence of forgeries that were used to bolster papal authority in the Middle Ages does not detract from the genuine evidence we have that Christ established apostolic succession. Okay, but uh, 
it does because this was used again to expand not just the teaching of Rome as first among equals, which evolves into Rome having a special charism and office, which then expands into on the basis of the forgeries, Rome having universal temporal supremacy over all rulers and emperors to make the Pope not only spiritually authoritative, but the world emperor. Do you not understand, Trent, that there were ecumenically agreed upon canons in the ecumenical councils that restricted all prelates from not being involved in temporal state offices. They can't be governors or warriors. Do you understand that? So this innovation by your antichrist pope is an antichrist innovation. and gave a special charism to the Apostle Peter and to his successors. For a long time, cans were the... Uh, where is the basis for the special charism? Which, by the way, notice how it went from special charism to universal God-Emperor status. That the supposed purpose for the papacy which is to give us certitude and and certainty on dogma the last hundred years of roman catholicism has proven that that doesn't actually work uh and in fact it is demonstrably the case that it does not solve the dilemma that it's supposed to solve we know from vatican one the way it lays out a certain anthropology and a certain epistemology that could be classed as classical foundationalism that essentially the way that you know the true church according to vatican one is that you just simply look at the history you tally up the facts and you look and see which institution has existed for 2000 years and has been infallible and inerrant, right? It literally says that this is, you just kind of look at history and you, you tally up these facts and you check these boxes. And that's how you'll know that the Roman Catholic church is the true church. That's the epistemology, epistemology, uh, based on, on, um, uh, um, the acceptance of the philosophy and epistemology and anthropology of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, right, which is, again, classical foundationalism. That's how you know. What Dyer is talking about here is the question of epistemology, or the study of how we yeah, determine I think I said that, what but constitutes thank you. knowledge. Basically, how do we know what we know, or how do— And I'll remind you that, uh, as per the debate, um, Trent had a freshman to sophomore level knowledge of epistemology and had no idea what he was talking about. We know our beliefs are true and justified, or that there are good reasons to support them. Dyer is critiquing foundationalism, but I'm not sure exactly what he means by the term. Basically, uh, yeah, it's only a common term in every textbook that deals with epistemology. So again, uh, that he claims to not know what I'm talking about is either disingenuous or just a demonstration of the fact that he didn't know what he was talking about, which we showed very clearly in the debate. So I don't know what he means by this term. Well, let's look at the um, classic texts, such as a text used in any college program out there, any university, the Bonjour text. Uh, epistemology, classical problems and contemporary responses. What is the whole chapter here, uh, chapter 9, called? Uh, uh, what does this say? Can you guys read this? Uh, uh, I mean, d do you think I made this up? I don't know what he means. Um, coherentism versus foundationalism. So you just saw Trent saying, I don't know what he means by a term used in every textbook on epistemology. You will not find an epistemology text that does not discuss in depth with entire chapters foundationalism. And Trent just sat there saying that I don't know what Dyer means by found as if this is some fuzzy thing that I came up with. Let's see. Let's look at uh, Notre Dame graduate, Notre Dame Catholic graduate. I don't know if this guy's Catholic, but he's a graduate from your institutions, Trent. W, Dr. W.J. Wood. What is this chapter called? What does that chapter say? Foundationalism. Foundationalism. I don't know what Dyer means. 
uh, by a term that anybody who had had a introduction to philosophy or epistemology class would know what it means. This would be the view that our beliefs are inferred from other beliefs, but there can't be an infinite chain of beliefs. Otherwise, okay, so it doesn't even go. So he doesn't know what I mean. And then he says what basic doxicality and foundationalism is. So he does know what I mean. Couldn't justify anything. Instead, the beliefs have to terminate in foundational beliefs or beliefs that we know to be true simply by thinking about them. So when it comes to proving that God exists, for example, we start with the general reliability of our sense perception as a foundation and then reason from that to a... Okay, so Trent basically just states basic bitch evidentialism, basic bitch empiricism, um, really nothing to do with the question of foundationalism and justification. So, I mean, it's true that in uh, epistemology, things like the basic reliability of sense perception and these kinds of things are... You know they're part of that domain but uh foundationalism is a very specific idea and a very specific doctrine which i think most medieval philosophers would be classified as is what's called classical foundationalism the idea that there's self-evident principles and maxims this is the way that his own philosophers like dr ed Fazer define it transcendent cause of the universe or god or when it comes to proving Christianity, we start with reliable sense perception, move to... I mean, I hope everybody remembers in the debate that Trent uh, didn't know what uh, exactly these terms were, and I called him out on that. And when he explained what his view of self-evident principles was, he gave Descartes' cogito. So you're talking to a person who thinks Descartes' cogito is a clear, uh, doxastically basic idea reliable historical documents, and then use those documents to show that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. But Dyer is a presuppositionalist, which is more of a Protestant epistemology that says we have to presuppose... Yeah, it's called a genetic fallacy, uh, the fact that there are Protestants who believe in uh, presuppositionalism doesn't mean that I'm a Protestant epistemologist any more than you're a pagan because you cite Aristotle. Every Roman Catholic has a love affair fascination with Aristotle that they derive, especially from Aquinas. Um, does that make you an Aristotelian? I mean, this is just childish level argumentation. Christianity is true before we can show it's true. You'll recall that in my rebuttal of John MacArthur, he made similar arguments as well, and I showed what's wrong with that. No, you didn't actually show anything in our debate other than that you didn't really understand the argument or what basic epistemology was about. And Dyer reveals in another video how he went to a Protestant seminary named after one of the main guys who practiced this approach to knowledge. Oh my gosh, I gotcha. <gasps> Whoa, you mean like how Scott Hahn went to a Protestant seminary too? <gasps> Whoa, gotcha. And this is all important to know because the argument Dyer gives against Catholicism is actually Protestant in nature. And because of that, it cut... So, uh, Trent... As we saw in our debate, your lack of knowledge of basic philosophy and epistemology also extends to fallacies. This is called the genetic fallacy. Now, you put yourself as, out as a debater, and you've done well in many debates, especially in the cosmic skeptic debate, which I gave you a lot of props for. But you ought to know better than this one, Trent. This is really low level, low tier, really dumb. It doesn't matter where an argument comes from. It has nothing to do with its truth or falsity, right? The validity, the soundness of an argument is irrespective of the source of the argument. That's why it's called the genetic fallacy. It's against Eastern Orthodoxy as well. And then when we come to the question of how do we know what the... I'm not even going to reply to that because we've replied to that so many times and we, he and I had a debate on that. The problem is the Roman Catholicism are the answer is that well, you follow the Pope and you follow the Pope when he's teaching authoritatively in extraordinary or universal ordinary magisterium. And you also have to follow the normative, not universal ordinary magisterium, ordinary magisterium as well, right? So all three of these layers of Roman Catholic dogma have to be followed dis despite the fact of these sort of descending levels of authority that they possess. I mean, imagine the irony of a Roman Catholic trying to critique uh, using an argument that a Protestant gave when their whole Novus Ordo liturgy was constructed and devised by Protestants. Hello, Trent. Did you know that Anglican and Lutheran scholars drew up your Novus Ordo liturgy? <gasps> Ooh. Yes. 
But then the question, though, is that how do I know that I'm interpreting these documents? Because that's, it still has to get to me as the individual Catholic, right? It still has to get into my head. And so when we ask a question about certitude and we say that instead of it just being like the Protestants, you read those books and interpret those books, then we just add on the, the so let's say we got the Bible here, a Protestant and the Roman Catholic says, ah, but you need the Pope to help you interpret the Bible. Then we stack that on, right? Well, now we've got just a bunch of more documents and writings and teachings and encyclicals and, and councils, right? Now we just added this book here of all the ecumenical councils, right, of the Roman Catholic system. Well, that still doesn't solve the problem that we've asked, which is an epistemic problem, an epistemic question of how we know. I'm really interested to see how he replies to this. Right. Because remember, the original problem was that Protestants can't interpret the Bible correctly. They need the Pope. Well, how do I know that I'm interpreting the Pope correctly? It's a it's a moving the problem back a step and it's not actually answering the epistemic question. Okay, so Dyer's argument is that the church can't give us certainty when it comes to biblical interpretation. Because now we have to ask, how do we know we're interpreting magisterial documents correctly? Do we need a magisterium that interprets the magisterium for us? Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. But in his video on why he isn't a Protestant, Dyer says that one of the reasons is because in order to interpret Scripture, you have to include sacred tradition as well. But you can't divorce the Bible and its understanding and its, the whole ethos that goes into how to interpret those texts from the life of the church and from the history of the church. And that's what Protestantism has to do. Well, doesn't this just push the question back one step? It kicks the can down the road. Dyer's same argument against the Pope goes against sacred tradition. No, it doesn't, because I don't have the same epistemology. And this is why we went into the whole debate uh, about foundationalism versus non-foundationalism, or what, what I, I would call, uh, not coherentism, but a revelational epistemology, right? So, um, so Trent is really confusing the fact that in my paradigm, I have a place for tradition with, well, you're no different than me. You're just like the Roman Catholic. You're just like the papist, except that instead of the Pope, it's you reading the church fathers and the councils. Yeah, but I don't have the same epistemology as you. I don't have a foundationalist epistemology, which requires me to uh, do this in a sort of piecemeal evidentialist approach. You do have that. So again, Trent doesn't understand the difference of paradigms and how not every paradigm is susceptible to the same fundamental presuppositional problems. That's precisely why we're presuppositionalists, because we don't accept the self-evident, ref self-referencing circular argumentation of classical foundationalism, which refutes classical foundationalism. You understand that when a classical foundationalist admits that his self-evident principles are self-evident and don't require any other principles, you all, all you have to do is start bringing in the issues of how do you know what the delineation between the self-evident and non-self-evident is? Do you have a list of those? Oh, well, it's all of these and none of these. Okay, well, that's a prior commitment that's more fundamental than we, what you said was supposedly self-evident and fundamental. So what was self-evident now requires on a more, now rests on something more fundamental. This is a classic issue that's brought up in epistemology to critique the notion of self-evidence, which again shows that Trent has no knowledge of epistemology other than a rough overview smattering that I guess he got in college. Because if he had read any deeper into epistemology, he would know that this is a very famous critique of the idea of self-evidence. Question two, how do I interpret sacred tradition? This is especially true in orthodoxy, which is a decentralized religion that has many interpretive traditions and no universal way to codify them. What's interesting... Uh, well, hold on. The fact that it's decentralized does not mean that orthodoxy has many interpretive traditions. So that's a non sequitur there. Uh, I don't know where he gets this idea. I think <clears throat> Roman Catholics think that uh, anything, quote, decentralized or, uh, you know, autocephalous national churches, these kinds of things, which... It, existed throughout the entire first thousand years of the church again they refuse them because they think their church was the true church of the first thousand years uh it had autocephalous churches you claim that your church is the church of the first thousand years which has auto so you're refuting your own church you, you don't see this this is a silly argument but um the thing is that protestants make this same objection and they act trent 
this is a genetic fallacy again. It doesn't matter that Protestants make this or that argument or this or that objection. That has nothing to do with the truth or false of the argument or whether the argument's a good argument or not. That's the genetic fallacy. So he's sort of just falling back on kind of uh, uh, cheap appeals to, oh, that's Protestant. Oh, that's, I mean, I could just sit here and say, okay, well, Aristotle's pagan. Why does your church rely so heavily on Aristotle? Uh, you're a pagan. Would, would, would Trent accept that as a legitimate critique? Of course not. And I wouldn't make that argument per se, unless it was about something like divine simplicity or defining God's essence as pure act, then I would make that critique, right? But it really depends on what argument, what the argument is. So the source of the argument has nothing to do with the truth. Or, and we see this from the Roman Catholics all the time too, when I bring up David Hume's arguments. Oh, are you a Humean skeptic? That's a David Hume argument. Or so what? Who cares? It doesn't matter if Judas made the argument. It doesn't matter if Satan appears and makes the argument. The fact that the argument came from Satan has nothing to do with whether it's true or false. Like interpreting the magisterium statements is as difficult as interpreting scripture. But the two are not the same. Unlike sacred scripture, the living magisterium can continually clarify teachings for each Okay, so uh, Trent is just explaining the, the Roman Catholic position. Uh, he's not actually giving an answer to the epistemic dilemma that I posed. Have you noticed this? This was not an answer to my question about circularity. He just said, well, Dyer has the same problem because he believes in tradition. Now, I gave a critique of your foundationalist position, the very same critique I gave in our debate. So your answer is to just state the Roman Catholic position. And you'll notice, pay attention when Roman Catholic apologists do this. They do this all the time, where they think that an argument is stating their position. Thomas especially love to do this. I don't know why they think this is an argument. Perhaps because they think you can just appeal to authorities as proofs, right? All right, <laughs> it's, oh, well, uh, Aquinas said it, so there, case closed, right? Uh, stating your position is not an argument for your position, okay? I I'm glad that you... Tell us the Roman Catholic view, we, but I think we know it. I want to know how your position is avoiding a very precise, very clear, very specific epistemological critique that I gave. Subsequent generation to make sure the body of Christ understands them. It's way easier to pick up the universal Catholic catechism and see what Catholics believe than to do a survey of East. Oh, is it really? So wait a minute, Trent, uh, do, do we do the death penalty or not? Uh, is religious liberty a heresy or is it cool? Uh, is Pachamama uh, good or is that enculturation or is that idolatry? Or well, remember, it's supposed to be easy. So now he's falling back on the, it's easy. Just pick up the catechism, dude. See how easy Roman Catholicism is? Well, if it's so easy, then why did you have to do coping about the death penalty? Orthodoxy. I mean, look at the question of marriage. The Catholic Church holds to the firm principle that remarriage after divorce constitutes adultery. This is what Jesus said in Mark. Yeah, this is all the platitudes that they always uh, go back on and, and pretend that they have the moral trump card. I'm so sick of their moral trump cards, man. And it just produces these uh, zealot maniacs who act like just idiots on the internet, right? The, the hordes of the trads online. Who don't know anything about any of this stuff and they just go wild with this stuff right because they feel that they have this moral superior trump card and i mean has anybody heard about annulments does anybody know what the actual actual practice of annulments in the roman catholic church is actually like so dude come on nobody is really buying this uh moral trump card argument anymore okay it's not the 1950s trend this doesn't work or the 1940s prior to vatican ii where you have this this big uh you know uh trump card and by the way uh here's the entire documentary that ubi did where uh-oh turns out there's some popes who advocated for things that trent says the roman catholic church never taught uh-oh andale andale uh-oh so there's the link what you mean the canons of Basil allow for remarriage? What? You mean the Roman Catholic Church accepted the canons of Basil for several centuries, which allowed for separation and remarriage? Uh-oh. So your church innovated. So the fact that you innovate and 
have, claim to have this moral high ground. Nobody buys this anymore, man. Your church is full of creeper, organized crime, PEDOs, man. This moral high ground stuff is bull crap. 10 verses 11 through 12. But in Eastern Orthodoxy, it's murkier when it comes to the question of when remarry. Yeah, so because we don't have a one-size-fits-all to every moral problem, and we allow it to be uh, discussed and determined on the basis of individuals with their spiritual father, he thinks that's some giant weakness when it's not. ...can be allowed. Really depends on who you ask. Here is what Khalees... Oh, wait a minute. Uh, what about in the Roman Catholic Church? Because it kind of depends on who I ask, you see. Ware says in his book on the Orthodox Church, Orthodox canon law, while permitting a second or even a third marriage, absolutely forbids. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip beyond in this theory, part because we've covered this. Is you just watch the Ubi's major videos. Episcopal or primation um, offices would present themselves. We'll be here forever if I don't uh, kind of move a little bit faster here. Other church leaders at their level to their own patriarch and to the Bishop of Rome as first among the patriarchs by the exchange and reception of letters of communion, according to ancient Christian custom. The Bishop of Rome would also inform the Eastern patriarchs of his election. So there is room for understanding the finer elements of the relationship between the successor of St. Peter and his brother bishops and patriarchs, but we have to first acknowledge the central leadership role in the church uh, no, we don't, uh, right? Because that's the thing that's in dispute. <laughs> so leadership role is not the same thing as indefectible, infallible, inerrant autocrat that unilaterally does things. And again, uh, the Vatican has more and more tempered this position post-Vatican I, not just with the collegiality statements in Vatican II, but with the Chieti document right here, which admits that basically the Orthodox position is true, uh, especially in the first thousand years. But by the way, please become Roman Catholic still. So literally that's all these ecumenical documents do. I can't share that link for some reason. So uh, it's right here if you want to go find it. No, not that. This. So this link for whatever reason is too long for the chat. Uh, but you can get it right here. It's... Synodality and primacy during the first thousand years towards a common understanding of the service of the unity of the church. Now, some of the uh, prominent Roman Catholics of recent note have even kind of been shook by this. Let's see if I can find that. Um, I think it's this one. No, that's not it. Uh, Catholic World Report, I think is it. This is it. Now, oh, that's just a fallible theologian. I don't care what he thinks. Oh, really? Well, how come he seems to admit the very thing that we Orthodox apologists are always admitting? Like, why is it that uh, this document doesn't matter, right? Even though it's a papally approved ecu ecumenist document, which the papacy approves the ecumenism post-Vatican II, and what does Dr. Adam DeVille over on Catholic World Report say? The way forward after the Catholic Orthodox Agreement on Primacy and Synodality. He's referring to the document that we're talking about, the Chieti document, which admits, again, that in the first thousand years of the church, it did not operate in a Vatican I way. That is all we need to do to prove that Vatican I is an innovation and is not true. So... The actual document won't link because it's too long. There's the Catholic World Report essay or a, a article on it. You can go pull it up because it won't link. I'll try to link it below because the address is just too dang long. Okay, but it's called Synodality and Primacy During the First Millennium Towards a Common Understanding and Service to the Unity of the Church. And it goes on to say, the, the Pope being first among equals did not operate in a unilateral Vatican I definition way. So here's the admission from the papacy, from the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, that the Orthodox reading is correct. And Francis says the exact same thing. Not Francis. Benedict says the same thing in Introduction to Christianity. And we had to have uh, Ibarra and all of that horde of people come and interpret the interpretation for us. 
Is that what Frank, is that what Benedict really meant? Or did he really mean something else? Let me give you 23 pages to explain what he meant in two pages. I'm Eric Ibarra. Yeah. Yeah, we need your interpretation of the interpretation of the interpretation because apparently nobody in the Vatican can get this stuff clear. We need all of the low-level lay apologists all throughout America to make this clear for us. Thank you. Yeah, that, I thought that's exact. That, that sounds a little Protestant, though. It's, it's kind of Protestant. I thought the papacy was supposed to solve these issues. No, we got to have every lay apologist explaining the interpretation of the interpretation of the church, which epistemological problem Trent just blew past. That Peter's successor plays. By the way, this is a common uh, Roman Catholic apologist approach. When in doubt, when you don't have an answer, just state the Roman Catholic position. That's a classic. We don't believe that in, in the Orthodox conception. So the first millennium of the church, the, the mindset of those Christians, especially at, say, the Sixth Council, was that they had no problem condemning a pope, Pope Honorius. Now, it doesn't matter whether you, I know that Roman Catholics say, well, he wasn't really a heretic. It doesn't matter because the argument that I'm making is that if an ecumenical council accepted as ecumenical had the mindset that they could condemn the Roman see, then the, the dogma of Vatican I was not in anyone's mind in the Sixth Council. I'm not sure what Dyer is getting at from when he's talking about Honorius. Of course, a pope... Okay, come on, Trent. You don't know what I'm getting at? <laughs> uh, was anything in that argument unclear? Okay, let's state it again clearly for you. If the Sixth Ecumenical Council had it in their mind as a gathered ecumenical council that they could declare a pope a heretic and a defector from the faith, then they did not have the attitude of Vatican I that the pope was infallible and could not defect from the faith. Is that clear enough for you? Did I make that clear enough for you? You said you're not sure what I was getting at. I think it's pretty clear what I'm getting at. Pope or an ecumenical council could render an unfavorable historical judgment. Of uh, that was not, no, notice the dishonesty and spin there. An, in, an unfavorable historical judgment. It says he is a heretic. That is not a historical judgment. That's almost a lie, Trent. It calls him a heretic. It explicitly says for his monotheletism teaching and two subsequent councils include him in their heresiologies and excommunication pronouncements as a heretic. He is also included in the Synodicon, which I know you won't care about that as a Roman Catholic, but for Orthodox, that's part of the Seventh Ecumenical Council for us. Uh, and it lists all kinds of goober heretics among whom is Honorius. On a previous pope for failing to check a heresy in the church. Nope, it is, he is not condemned for failing to check a heresy. He is condemned because his letter advocates monotheletism. Which is what the ratified Third Council of Constantinople did in the case of Honorius. Not true. It calls him a heretic. It excommunicates him. And the Seventh Ecumenical Council repeats it, as well as the Synodicon. I'm not going to get into the whole affair because Dyer yeah, doesn't because do that. He either. doesn't want to get into the affair because it clearly refutes the indefectibility of the Roman see, which is fundamental to Vatican I. So again, this is one of the easiest ways to refute. Notice what he just did there. I'm not going to get into this. I bet you're not because it's a clear refutation of your whole system. Remember what Ibarra said. All you got to produce, all you got to do is produce one example of a contradiction. And then I won't believe in the papacy. Okay, here's one. I'm not going to get into that one. But I will say that the Third Council of Constantinople did not define that Honorius erred by binding all of the faithful. To it doesn't matter. To err or become a heretic, it does not require you to bind all of the faithful. Again, this is a game that trads play and Roman Catholics play, where in order to defend and excuse popes from heresy... They will narrow the definition of what is required to be a heretic to something that no one could even fulfill except the Pope. So notice what he just did there. Well, Honorius didn't bind the whole church to his teaching, so he couldn't be a heretic. In other words, as if the only way to be a heretic 
is to ex cathedra bind everyone to it. Nobody can do that except the Pope. So it's like an unfalsifiable position. <laughs> you see what he did there? No, it is not. To be a heretic does not require you binding the entire church to it. If that was the case, then no one could be a heretic because who has the authority to bind the entire church except the Pope in the Roman Catholic position? You see how silly this is? This is a game they play where they will change the definition and change what it requ what is required to be a heretic to save face, to save their position. It's also intellectually dishonest because he knows that Martin Luther was called a heretic. Did Martin Luther have the ability to bind the whole church to his interpretation? And yet he's called a heretic. Likewise, every other heretic, or even in the idea of Roman Catholic theology of condemned propositions. Why would I go to condemned propositions? Because this is a more broad way to condemn heretics that doesn't require the specific naming of the heretic. Imagine how silly it would be to think that the only way to be a heretic is to have your name explicitly mentioned by the church. Oh, by the way, Honorius's name is explicitly mentioned more than twice. It's three times in councils by the church. But condemned propositions show us that from the Roman Catholic vantage point, they would condemn a proposition so you could know that anyone that held that proposition was a heretic. In other words, condemned propositions proves that Trent's characterization about what is required to be a heretic is completely ridiculous and false in his system. So it has nothing to do with whether Honorius bound everybody to his heresy. Anybody, especially clerics, publicly teaching heresy are heretics. It has nothing to do with the ex cathedra binding. As just again, do you see how silly this is? So the only way to be a heretic in Trent's idea, in Trent's mind, is if you bind the church to the heresy? That's not true. Believe in the heresy of monothelitism, which would contradict papal infallibility. It uh, so he admits that if Honorius believed in monothelitism or taught it, it would contradict papal infallibility. Uh, that is why he's condemned in the council, Trent. Maybe you should read the Sixth Ecumenical Council because it would actually tell you why he's condemned. And so would the Seventh Council. If you read the Seventh Council, it reaffirms the condemnation of Honorius as a heretic. He did condemn Honorius for following this view himself and causing that heresy. Oh, so he now he admits that Honorius did follow the view. Did you hear that? Let's go back. Pope or an ecumenical council could render an unfavorable historical judgment upon a previous pope for failing to check a heresy in the church, which is what the ratified third... Now, notice how it shifted. First, he said uh, an unfavorable historical judgment. So he's trying to shift it away from heresy. It's not a historic... What, what does that even mean? There's no such thing as an unfavorable historical judgment. An ecumenical council meets to either determine if you're teaching error or truth. So he's just making up bullshit. Council of Constantinople did in the case of Honorius. I'm not going to get into the whole affair because notice that, look at this. How many 2,800 Roman Catholics thought this was a good response? I mean, talk about delusion. I mean, am I in the twilight zone? I mean, d d can other people not see that this is ridiculous? What he's saying? <laughs> Do that either. But I will say that the Third Council of Constantinople did not define that Honorius erred by binding all of the faithful to Doesn't believe matter. in the heresy That's of That's not what's required to be a heretic. Which would contradict papal infallibility. Okay, so uh, it, you admit it, that it would contradict only if he bound people. No, it contradicts the indefectibility of the Roman See. I'm so tired of these people, they will not address indefectibility. They will always deflect it onto infallibility because that allows them to insert at any point that they want the out that it wasn't infallible. So just pinpoint them on, okay, let's set that aside because you're going to just cope about that and do a two-step. Let's talk about indefectibility. How is the Roman see indefectible when Honorius defected 
and three councils call it heresy. I would say that's a defection. Now, he just admitted that if he taught heresy, it would contradict. It did condemn Honorius for following this view himself and causing that heresy. It did condemn him for following this view himself and causing these problems. So it went from unfavorable historical judgment. It wasn't binding, but he did hold this view. Trent just contradicted himself. ...to be spread throughout the church. Pope Leo II confirmed the council's decrees, but he added the detail that Honorius was, was anathematized because he, quote, did not illuminate this apostolic see with the doctrine of apostolic tradition but permitted her, who was undefiled, to be polluted <laughs> by profane teaching. Okay, so remember that uh, Trent utilized the St. Maximus quote supposedly to prove the infallibility and inerrancy and primacy of the Roman see. Remember at the beginning of the talk? And now he's citing another pope pointing out that Honorius allowed the apostolic see to be polluted and defiled in teaching so he failed to illuminate the apostolic sea allowing it to be defiled polluted and profaned so number one this proves that he was misquoting the saint maximus quote earlier on which was supposed to prove indefectibility and infallibility blah 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 now we're getting another pope who says this about honorius which again proves that the roman sea is not indefectible since a pope can err when he isn't making an infallible judgment, this only represents an unfortunate episode in the church's history. Uh, no, it represents a refutation of your of your position. So you just floundered, you just fell right there. Uh, and he says it's it's unfortunate. So look at this admission. Look at this admission. This admission, as Ibarra says, disproves the system. And all Trent's doing is talking around it and coping. Three, not an example of a dogmatic contradiction. And as a uh, it is a dogmatic contradiction. The quote that you just read said that the apostolic see was defiled and polluted in its teaching. I thought the apostolic see guides us and does not err and does not have polluted teaching, but you mischaracterized it, rebranded it, revi revisionist. Oh, it's just an unfortunate incident, but it wasn't binding. Okay, since when does heresy require binding everyone to it? There is no requirement. That's a made-up thing that Trent made up to save his ridiculous position. Note in my book, The Case for Catholicism, even... Eth oh, yeah, just buy my book. Okay, so I'm a grifter, according to the trads, right? Uh, he flounders and fails on this important point of the Sixth Council and just says, buy my book. Orthodox scholars like Yaroslav Pelikan or Father Laurent Cleanwork do not believe Pope Honorius. Okay, so uh, when Pelikan wrote his books, he was not Orthodox, he was Lutheran. So he's not citing uh, somebody who was fully Orthodox. And Father Cleanwick is a radical ecumenist. So ne neither of these are solid sources. And those are people who, uh, at one so Cleanwick wants to go back to Rome or whatever his name is. He sent me his book. Um, so citing some wannabe uniate. Uh, what does that have to do? How is that re responding to this issue? So he's just pulling out two people that back up the Roman Catholic position. So what? You just contradicted yourself totally with your with your actual quotes, dude. And by the way, this is the this is the sixth council, which is where he was trying to use the Maximus quote from. Remember, Maximus is the theologian par excellence of the sixth council, along with Saint Sophronius of Jerusalem. The first quote that he gave early on in his talk was St. Maximus supposedly proving Vatican I. And now he's at the Sixth Council admitting all of my points that Honorius, Honorius did teach heresy, but he didn't bind everybody to it. So what? Did the council think that it was necessary for him to bind everybody to call him a heretic? No. He's excommunicated and he's in the heresiologies. Was guilty of heresy himself, but only that he was guilty of using ambiguous language that unfortunately allowed a heresy to spread uh the quote totally contradicts that and he's wrong the council specifically says that he taught monothelitism so again he's he changes the position like four times look at the quote honoria this is from another pope 
Honorius did not illuminate the apostolic see with the doctrine of apostolic patricia, but permitted her who was undefiled to be polluted. How did he do that? By just not doing his job? Well, Trent said a minute ago that he, it, he held to the position. And by the way, the council condemns him for holding to the position. Oh, can't <laughs> air when he isn't. Like, this is. Unacceptable in view of the dialogue with the Orthodox, but from the but also from the very nature of the matter itself, and even Schunenberg, this uh, Jesuit theologian himself, does not stick to it through the thick and thin. In fact, dogma as a single tenet proclaimed by the Pope ex cathedra is the latest and lowest way of of forming dogma. The original form in which the Church states her faith in binding way is the creed or the symbol in the profession of faith. And then he goes on to say, to look for dogmatic statements like this prior to Vatican I is absurd. Well, that's an admission that Vatican I uh, is a innovation, that it's a, an evolution of doctrine and, and praxis for the Church. When it comes to Cardinal Ratzinger, this is an excerpt from Introduction to Christianity, where Ratzinger is going over the virgin birth and commenting on theologians who push the limits— to say that the church could allow belief that the virgin birth is a legend, apparently because there's no dogmatic definition that Christ was born of a virgin. Ratzinger is critiquing the Dutch theologian Piet Schoenenberg, who argued that you could believe this about the virgin birth in his book, The Christ. Ratzinger says Schoenenberg looks in vain, quote, for a magisterial dogmatic pronouncement relating to the virgin birth, and that he's being unreasonable for withholding belief in this doctrine, just because there's no papal ex cathedra definition of it, like we have for the Immaculate Conception. So the whole point of what he's talking about here is that infallible teachings come not just from papal ex cathedra statements, but also from the ordinary and universal magisterium of the Church. At the most fundamental level, this would be the creeds that were universally agreed upon throughout Church history, and unquestioningly say we believe in Jesus Christ, who was born of the Virgin Mary. But we wouldn't expect popes in the past to use the precise formulations given at Vatican I in their infallible teachings that, of course, were given long before Vatican I. No, but we would because of the fact that Satis Cognitum and Pastor Aeternus specify that the Vatican I definition and doctrine has always been the teaching and view of the Church from the earliest days, and that it was universally accepted. That's what, that's like the first few paragraphs, uh, if I recall, from Satis Cognitum. So we would expect that because your Church claims that that exists, Trent. And indeed, there are many instances of popes intending to teach something in an infallible way. So the substance is there of infallibility, even if the precise formulations of it come later. So using the particular form... Yeah, but see, that's what is uh, in question here, right? that we're always asking for uh, the Roman Catholics to produce this. And what we always get is quote minds, forgeries, uh, wild interpretations of typology and biblical texts, which are not consistent, like Matthew 16, two chapters later in Matthew 18, Jesus says the exact same thing to the whole college of the apostles as it regards the uh, exercise of the office of the keys. Uh, so it's, it's, it's always this sort of shifting sand and this arbitrary sort of, uh, oh, well, here's this quote from St. Maximus, uh, see Vatican I, right, I got you. And what did we just see? The first quote from Maximus from the Sixth Council, which he tried to argue proved Vatican I, then he just does this whole five-minute floundering failure about the Sixth Council on Honorius, contradicting himself within one minute, and putting up a papal quote from the Sixth Council that contradicts the, his interpretation of Maximus's quote. The pure and undefiled sea of Rome was polluted and defiled. His quotes. Did he even pay attention to the, did he forget? The, maybe it took him hours to put this video together. Did he forget the quotes that he used in the first 10 minutes? That they contradict the quote that he used uh, 40 minutes in? Is the Roman sea pure and undefiled or did it get defiled, Trent? 
And how does that work with indefectibility? Please help me understand based on your quotes, based on your quote minds. Outlined at Vatican One is probably what Cardinal Ratzinger meant by saying this is the latest way of exercising infallibility. And you could also call it the lowest way, as Ratzinger does in this footnote that Dyer points out, because there are more fundamental ways of exercising the charism of infallibility God gave the church. Paragraph 891 of the... Uh, is it really the case that um, the other ways other than the papacy are the fundamental ways? Uh, does Vatican I say that the other ways are fundamental to the exercising of the Petrian charism or the charism of infallibility? No, it says that the Petrian charism is the normative way. So uh, what Ratzinger is doing that he's trying to explain away is giving us admissions. He's admitting our positions and our arguments because the Chieti document, Chieti document says exactly the same thing that Ratzinger says in his famous footnote, which all of these people in their infinite copes explain away. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean what you say it means. Ratzinger says in the footnote that the modus operandi of the first thousand years of Christianity is not the Vatican one way, right? They were not operating that way because the Chieti document says the same thing. It says that it was not a unilateral approach by the part of the Roman bishop. So that is an admission that the Vatican I mindset is not the mindset of the first thousand years of the church. That's clearly what Ratzinger says because he's an ecumenist and because he's trying to give a place to the orthodox position, just like the Chieti document is trying to do. So it's not it's not that difficult, right? If you've watched these ecumenist things for you know all these years and what it fails to produce, then you know how it operates. It's a bunch of bureaucracy and granting of this and that. I mean, this is why the Roman church has rehabilitated Luther. Oh, he's not so bad. He's not that bad of a guy. Well, he's, he's all right. He's not that bad. Look at the joint declaration between Roman Catholics and Luke, Lutherans. It's signed by the papacy. Um, but I, I would encourage you to go read what Ratzinger actually says. You can find it on a million different websites because it was a controversial statement. And But thankfully, we have all the Roman Catholic apologists to, uh, to cope and interpret it for us to help us understand because... Uh, you know, really Ratzinger is just trying to faithfully affirm uh, Roman Catholicism. So it's page 279 of, of inter uh, Introduction to Christianity. Here's the footnote. And you can screenshot that or do whatever you want to do to go read it yourself. But he says that the modus operandi of the church in the first thousand years was not papal. Okay, again, do you understand, Trent, that the argument is that your documents say that the church always knew, understood, and operated this way? And at Vatican I and in Satis Cognitum, they thought that was necessary to prove, right? Because they didn't want to argue for innovation. So the argumentation on the part of the so-called uh, conservative, quote unquote, or ultramontanes was that we can't admit that this is an innovation. But other scholarly people knew that it was an innovation. And so you have people like Colonel uh, Newman saying, no, it is a development of doctrine. Oh, well, which one is it? Is it always clear from the outset or is it something that evolved and developed? Those are mutually exclusive claims, you see. So if you want to read where I'm getting that from, you can go read, uh, it's called Satis Cognitum of Leo the 13th. And then you can also read, uh, I would recommend reading the all the decrees of Vatican I. It's not that long. They're right here. It's about, if you print it out, it's about 15 pages. Uh, because what, what really helps in these dis discussions and disputes is when they're familiar with their own documents. And the only way to do that is to just read them. So here is Vatican I. And part of two of the sessions of Vatican I are Pastor Eternus. Okay, Pastor Eternus is uh, Pius the Ninth statement about the Supreme Pontiff. Okay, and just as almost as almost as important as uh, Pastor Eternus is Leo the Thirteenth Encyclical Satis Cognitum. Okay, they're both very important, and both of them are about the role of the Roman bishop. 
uh, and his supremacy and how he's necessary for the unity of the church. And in Satis Cognitum, Leo XIII says, we know universally from the earliest times and at all times that the primacy, universality, indefectibility, et cetera, blah, 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 of the Roman bishop was always held. Okay, so that's your claim, Trent. That's why the burden of proof is upon you guys when you make that statement. And then when we ask for the proof of that in the early church, what we almost always get is, well, it's a seed that evolved. Okay, it's not explicit. And Trent just said that. We wouldn't expect the early church to use the explicit definitions that Vatican I uses. Oh, oh why wouldn't we when your popes say that it was always there? Catechism, for example, says infallibility is present in the church, quote, above all in an ecumenical council, which is where all the bishops of the world gathered to... Okay, but the fact that it says above all just proves that Vatican I wanted to temper, or Vatican II wanted to temper Vatican I with collegiality. So uh, that's the new latest update Roman statement, right? Just like we saw Trent earlier admitting that, uh, well, there's different ways to understand Francis's change of view on the death penalty. So again, basically admitting my points. Trads, how, how do you not see this? Okay, I mean, are, do the trads actually think that Trent's arguments here are solid? Do you do you think that Francis isn't changing uh, any doctrines on the death penalty when he says the death penalty is against the gospel? Ha, ha, that's not a change. Together in union with the Pope to solemnly define and infallibly def and in some cases infallibly define matters of dogma. And of course, papal infallibility is not restricted to the dogmatic definitions we see in something like the Immaculate Conception. Popes have been intending to teach infallibly long before that. And many theologians say another example that when the Pope acts infallibly is when he canonizes saints. But to summarize, the fact that Cardinal Ratzinger says papal infallibility is different. Uh, great admission there, uh, because I only need to bring in the reversal of status for the pillars of orthodoxy. Because uh, in the Roman Catholic communion for a long time, we would have the excommunication and considering uh, that they are the uh, amongst the damned of uh, St. Photius the Great, uh, St. Mark of Ephesus, and St. Gregory of Palamas. So uh, you just heard Trent admit that most Roman Catholic theologians do include sainthood under the banner of magisterium. Now, uh, as a Roman, when I was Roman Catholic, I always thought and understood that to be the case. I mean, let's think about the opposition. If you're a Roman Catholic, imagine the possibility that sainthood isn't part of the magisterium. Well, if it's not, I could call into question every single Roman Catholic saint ever. Thus, that whole system would be underdone, right? It would, it would, un, it would undo. It would fall apart. Oh, so I can question the sanctity of St. Athanasius, of St. Augustine, uh, of all the sainted popes the first thousand years. You see how silly this would be in the Roman Catholic system. I'm not saying I believe it. I'm saying in the Roman Catholic system, how silly it would be, how defeating to the system it would be to say that sainthood is not part of the magisterium. And really, the only people who say that are like, you know, the, some of the trads, basically, SSPX, because they don't want to admit that John Paul II is a saint. Obviously, that should be obvious why, right? So SSPX don't want to admit that, but clearly, if Roman Catholicism is true, you have to submit, as Vatican I says, not just to the dogmatic decisions, but also to the decisions of the Roman congregations, including the Holy Office and so forth. But note, Trent admitted, oh, sainthood is part of the magisterium. So, but wait a minute. Rome told us for centuries that Palamas, Photius, and Mark of Ephesus were damned heretics. Oh, but they've been re rehabilitated for the purposes of ecumenism, and now they're saints. Okay, so Rome was wrong about something that's now dogma, according to Trent. That's called a contradiction. Roman Catholics, do you understand this? I mean, we had a, we had a debate with a trad uh, on Discord uh, about five or six months ago. And I spent about three hours restating and re-explaining this argument to him. And he wasn't a stupid guy. Uh, I, I, I'm baffled. I don't understand how a person who's a Roman Catholic can't understand this argument. How for centuries can 
your dogmatic papal leader tell us that the three pillars of orthodoxy are damned heretics. They're they're floating in flames, baby. They are down there in Dante's Inferno. Okay. Oh, but wait a minute. In the 20th century, due to the scholarship of Father Francis de Vornick, the famous Uniate, they have been re- rehabilitated. And now they are saints that Uniates can accept and revere. Did you hear that? So Trent just admitted that sainthood is part of dogma. And I just gave you an example of a change of dogma and a contradiction. And remember what Eric Abar said. If all you got to do is give one example of a contradiction and the whole system would fall apart. In scope or in the amount of times it's been used does not refute the concept of papal infallibility in general. The next problem. Well, so multiple things refute it, but now he's appealing to, well, but in general. Really? Well, and the next reason I would not be a Roman Catholic is the, con- the contradictions of Vatican II. Vatican II in many, many, many places contradicts uh, prior dogmatic teaching. And I'll go to some of these examples for you, some of the more blatant examples, one of which would be the uh, ecumenical movement itself. If you read Mortalium Animos, the famous encyclical of Pius XI, in the 1920s, it absolutely condemned as apostasy all forms of interfaith gatherings. And that document would actually be classed under universal ordinary magisterium because it was normative for the entire Roman Catholic communion. Vatican II is the complete official papal Roman see acceptance of the most extreme forms of ecumenism all the way up to what we see now with Pachamama. I already dealt with the episode involving Pachamama, so I'm not going to belabor the point here. Uh, well, I, I haven't watched your episode on Pachamama, so why wouldn't you bring that in to this refutation when it's a huge example of a scandal and apostasy? Dyer's argument seems to be that Vatican II's endorsement of— okay, he, This is like the third time now where he said my arguments seem to be when they are abundantly clear what my arguments are, right? I'm not sure what Jay means by foundationalism when it's a term in every epistemology textbook. I don't know what Jay means here about the Sixth Council. Uh, his argument seems to, my argument is very clear that Pachamama is a clear as day example of idolatry and demonic action on the part of Francis that nobody in, in good conscience can defend. All right. So I wish I could have, I'm not going to go fish up fish out uh, what his response on Pachamama was. But uh, why would he not bring that in when he's responding to my arguments? And I just made a clear argument as to what it was. Again, Trent, did you not hear the argument? Or do you have problems up here? Like, I'll make it very clear for you. So uh, prior to Vatican II, documents like Mortalium Animos, which we will look at right here, explicitly call interfaith gatherings, prayer meetings, and ecumenist uh, stuff, uh, a surrendering of the faith, watering down, a destruction of the gospel, apostasy, um, horrible errors. Uh, I mean, it just goes on and on and on if you read the document. False opinions, uh, a betrayal of the gospel, on and on and on and on. It's a, it's a su- super strongly worded encyclical about interfaith gatherings from 1928 by Pius XI, very famous. It's about the ecumenist movement as a false promotion of unity, false demonic promotion of unity and a falling away from the true religion and true faith, a rejection of it. Do you see what it says right there? The ecumenists and their attempt for religious communion and unity distort the true religion and reject it. They reject it. They reject it. It's a rejection. It says there in the text, trads, rejection. I am so sick of trads who act like, and they tell me to my face, that this encyclical doesn't say that. It doesn't condemn ecumenism. Are you insane? What does the text say in front of your face? I've got it on the screen for you. It is a distortion of the true religion and a rejection. And by doing this, it leads to atheism and apostasy. Do not lie to yourself. Trads. 
Okay. You're not doing yourself a favor by lying about what this encyclical as clear as day says. And I just picked out one sentence. You can go read that whole encyclical. The whole encyclical says this. What good does it do you to be dishonest to yourself, to lie to yourself, to say that I'm a bad person for telling you what this encyclical says? Now, that encyclical says that interfaith gatherings and prayer meetings and ecumenous celebrations are apostasy. And then now we have a CZ gatherings and we have Pachamama and who knows what else is coming down the road. And it all stems from Vatican II, by the way, and Nostra Aetate. So this is not a difficult argument. To act like it's unclear what my argument is, is dishonest. I'm not sure what his argument is. The argument is clear as day. Go read the encyclical. Humanism is somehow at odds with previous papal teachings that prohibited Catholics gathering with non-Catholics. So notice that admission. Vatican II's ecumenism is somehow at odds with the previous prohibitions on interfaith gatherings. Do those sentences make sense? Do you understand the meaning of the sentences that you just said? Okay, is this O'Brien here? Are we are we in O'Brien's chamber of doublethink? Uh, on a side note, though, I want to point out that the 1986 interfaith gathering at Assisi that Dyer criticizes, there were also prominent Orthodox clerics there. Like, Correct. And uh, I've done many critiques, many videos, many interviews against ecumenism. And so, again, Trent, I don't know how many times I have to explain this argument. To, if my church was structured like your church, that might be a problem. Now, in the sense of, like, moral problems, it's a problem. Okay, I'm not saying ecumenism isn't a problem. It's the heresy of our day, for sure. Okay, but my church is not built on the indefectibility of the Roman See and the participation in pagan false world religion services, which exemplify a defection from the faith. There is no way that you can participate in those gatherings and be a Christian. It's not possible because to do that signifies that you do not believe the Christian faith anymore. So in other words, it would be like me saying, oh, I am a Christian. However, um, I just joined the Communist Party. And even though the Communist Party is an atheist organization and requires my atheism, I'm still a Christian. It, it makes no sense, right? It, does, it, it, it doesn't work. And it's not just a, quote, sin. In Roman Catholic theology, to participate in the religious services of other religions in traditional Roman Catholic theology and in Orthodox canon law, so it's the canon law of the first thousand years, right, of Orthodox Christianity, that if you participate in other religion services, you're automatically excommunicated. It's an excommunicatable offense. In Roman Catholic canon law, it is also an excommunicatable offense because it signifies the interior disposition of the person to have defected from the faith. That's classic traditional Catholic moral law, moral theology. So Catholics do moral theology. And if you look up what it means to defect or what apostasy is, it is cited as things like worshiping at Muhammad's shrine or uh, Muhammad's tomb praying and worshiping towards Mecca. Those would be signs of an interior disposition of apostasy. That's your church's definition of apostasy, Trent, not mine. Patriarchs of Moscow and Constantinople. But the main problem with Dyer's criticism is that he is assuming Vatican II is explicitly endorsing what could be called active communion with non-Catholics. So uh, is there anything in the condemnation of Mortalium Animos about, quote, active communion. So notice what Trent did was he redefined what problematic ecumenism is to not be interfaith gatherings. Oh, now it's just problematic communion. Okay, Mortalium Animos doesn't say anything about that because there's no way in Pope Pius XI's day he would have ever even thought about such a thing as intercommunion with heretics. He is talking about interfaith gatherings at all. 
And that's why it's so dishonest of the way that these people spin all this stuff to make it act like, well, I mean, it didn't technically use this term, active communion. So what? It condemns all of it wholesale. And anybody who's read Mortalium Animos can see that clear as day. It uses really strong language. Now, again, to prove this point, I'm not just relying on Mortalium Animos. Do you think that's the only pre-Vatican II condemnation of all these activities? Oh, no. Oh, no. The SSPX, as we said, love their beloved book, Popes Against the Modern Errors. And what is this book? As we said at the beginning of the show, please go get it. Even every Orthodox person should have this book. Why? Because I want you to be a papist? No way. Because this is the clearest, easiest way to demonstrate that the Roman Catholic Church has changed its positions. What is stated in this book, which is just 16 famous papal documents, is night and day with what is in the Vatican II documents. And it is not a fringe crazy. This is the largest uh, traditional Catholic publisher probably in the world, Tan Books. Every parish has books from Tan Books. Everybody knows who Tan Books is in the Catholic world. And everybody should know about these famous papal encyclicals. But I will go ahead and uh, say to you, I don't believe Trent has even read any of these. I seriously do not believe Trent has read pre-Vatican II encyclicals because unless he's completely dishonest, there is no way that a person in good faith can read these 16 papal documents against the modern errors and not see a night and day contradiction with the post-Vatican II church. Uh, Again, remember Trent's genetic fallacy earlier? when he was saying that presuppositionalism is bad because a Protestant uses it. And who drew up the Novus Ordo Mass? Oh, Protestants. You see how much of a self-own that is, Trent? You, You say that I'm bad for using an argument from a Protestant. You use a liturgy from Protestant liturgists at your Second Vatican Council, Trent. or praying the distinctive prayers of their own religion as if we were... Imagine this cope, right? Oh, it's not praying together because we all stand in the room and we pray our distinctive pagan religions privately. And that's not what happened at Assisi. They put a statue of the Buddha on the altar. They shut down and covered the crucifixes in the church so as to not offend the pagans. And they allowed voodoo practitioners into the side chambers of the cathedral so that is not what happened trent professing allegiance to that faith that's something catholics cannot do as a matter of divine law that no church directive could ever change wait a minute so divine and natural law can't change but remember at the beginning trent said that well if the death penalty goes away it's not a big deal because you can have different opinions on this wait wait i thought natural law natural justice don't change so do they change or not that's what i can't figure out So we can't pray with non-Catholics in this active sense. So he's invented a scholastic nuance, which is called casustry, where in order to, uh, you know, Jesus uh, sort of rebukes some people who do this very thing. I don't know if you've ever read the Gospels, but Jesus says, uh, you know, you come up with these uh, legalities and these technicalities to strain gnats while you swallow camels. And that's exactly what Trent's doing. And that Roman Catholics do the exact same thing on a host of issues, including their attempted moral trump cards, where they try to morally up everybody, when in fact this is all a bunch of casustry. Because Trent just said, oh, uh, I can go into the room and I can do the prayers and so forth, but it's not an act of praying with them because I'm praying privately. Number one, we don't know that that's what the popes were doing. Number two, according to Mortalium Animos, the mere presence at the events is itself scandalous because it gives the impression of relativism and subjectivism and waters it down. In other words, it's scandalous in itself to appear that way, even if you, in a dishonest, casustry way, try to say, oh, well, I wasn't praying with them. I was just in the mosque facing towards Mecca praying privately. That is baloney. That is bullshit. But we can pray with non-Catholics in the sense of praying in their presence, and this can include joint gatherings. In his- yeah, does anything like that total cope sound at all like what is in Mortalium Animos? 
I mean, the Trouds are so lazy, they won't even read this document from their Pope, which condemns this whole bunch of casuistry from Trent, right? Does this sound at all? How come, why didn't Pope Pius IX, 11th just say, oh, uh, you can go to all these gatherings for all these fraternal uh, interfaith gatherings. Um, just pray privately to yourself. No, that's this is a lie because your exterior actions reflect the interior disposition according to Catholic moral theology. That's the Catholic moral theology position. Do you understand that? That's not me making this up. Go read Alphonsus Liguori, right? The most famous moral theologian of the Catholic Church, who, by the way, said that it's okay to lie. Uh, Alphonsus Liguori says that your exterior actions reflect your interior disposition. So you can't get out of this by saying, oh, well, I was just pretending to worship at the shrine of Satan. Uh, in my heart, I was praying to Jesus. You see how stupid this would be? I mean, according to what Trent's saying, I could do that. I could go to a satanic shrine. I could worship uh, Baphomet. And then when people call me out, oh, uh, well, but no, privately, I was praying to Jesus. Trust me. You see how stupid this is? This is, this is why people find this religion to be hypocritical and ridiculous. Because it's an excusing of what is obviously apostasy and totally scandalous. Book Ecumenical Associations, James Oliver says, Pope Pius XI, quote, both welcomed the separated brethren and clearly stated what was and was not possible for Catholics regarding dialogue with non- Okay, so uh, citing some random scholar, what does this have to do with what Mortalium Animos argued? Catholic Christians concerning the- uh, By the way, Trent. I'm pretty sure that my encyclical trumps your random ass scholar in your system, doesn't it? Doesn't a papal encyclical trump some rando? Logical differences and unity. In 1949, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith released a document on ecumenism that outlined when it was and wasn't appropriate. So this isn't some radical... Yeah. The argument was that there's contradictions. And Trent's reply is, here's a bunch of documents and citations where we talk about it. Um, where is the response to my argument that Vatican II's Nostra Aetate and Pachamama, as an example, contradict Mortalium Animos? Where, where was the response to this? Trent says, here's some doctrines and documents that state our position. Again, not a, not a response to my argument. And we saw him do this earlier, right? Where when I brought up, uh, uh, what was it, the ancient canons? And his response was, here's our position. And this is a thing that Roman Catholics do all the time, where when they don't have an answer to the argument, uh, the you, you, can have the, you can give the appearance of having an argument by just stating your position. Post-Vatican II development. Here's a part of the CDF instruction. The previous permission of the Holy See, special for each case, is always required. And in the petition asking for it, it must also be stated what are the questions to be treated and who the speakers are. Okay, does anybody actually believe that everybody who participates in these interfaith gatherings is seeking the permission of the Holy See in each case? I mean, <laughs> to be at an ecumenical gathering. Although in all these meetings and conferences, any communication whatsoever in worship must be avoided. Okay, so that's nice that you have a document that says that uh, it shouldn't be abused. But tell me how that has anything to do with um, the trad Benedict praying towards Mecca in a mosque. Okay. Uh, can you help me understand how your citing of documents, what does that have to do with you telling me that Pope Benedict praying at the Blue Mosque towards Mecca. And, and how does your citing of the documents in any way make this make sense? So you have a document that says don't abuse this and get the Pope's permission. Okay, what about when the Pope does it uh, and he prays towards Mecca? And then when Francis does the exact same thing that Benedict does. And you're telling me that Oh, this is perfectly in line with Mortalium Animos, even though Mortalium Animos calls this apostasy. It's, it's nothing wrong with this. 
Yet, the recitation in common of the Lord's Prayer or of some prayer approved by the Catholic Church is not for... So we're supposed to think that Francis is praying the Lord's Prayer here <laughs> in, the, in the mosque? I mean, I can't believe people fall for this. Like, you really believe that, oh, he, he's, a, he's a champion for Jesus in the mosque praying towards Mecca. He's there to convert. The, I've actually heard the trad say this. Oh, he's there to convert the Muslims. Oh, really? Is that why Francis constantly says, don't proselytize and don't convert? Is that why they're building a Abrahamic faith center premised on not converting the Muslims? I mean, how much dishonesty does it take to be a trad these days? Remember this? And remember that right after the debate with Trent, this is what I brought up because Trent apparently didn't think the Trinity was in the Old Testament. I mean, again, demonstrates. So here they are building this abomination, the Abrahamic faith house in Abu Dhabi. I'm pretty sure that this is premised on not converting people because in the 2019 document on human fraternity, uh, Francis had his co-grand imam buddy up there saying that we all worship the same God. And the mere fact that Trent, in with a straight face, tells you that Jews, Christians, and Muslims worship the same Unitarian God of the Old Testament should tell you that Roman Catholics are heterodox. Roman Catholics do not have the Trinity. Anybody who has the Trinity would know that the Trinity is who is in the Old Testament appearing, uh, or excuse me, being worshipped by Abraham and all the patriarchs. That is Orthodoxy 101. And what does the Vatican support? Building a generic theism temple that's premised on not converting these people. And these liars will tell you that Francis and his goblins are up there really trying to convert the Muslims. No, they're not. Do not lie to me. They're not trying to convert them. They're trying to erect a generic theism world religion. And Francis and Benedict and John Paul said countless times, don't proselytize and convert people. So don't give me this line of baloney, dude. That, oh, he, he Francis is he's secretly in there. He's secretly going to convert the Muslims, dude. Bidden for opening or closing the said meetings. So it's true that divine law, as the Pope's have pointed out previously, prohibits active participation in non-Catholic rituals. But Vatican II's Declaration on Ecumenism does not instruct believers to engage in that kind of active communion. It doesn't matter what the document explicitly instructs them to do. The point is that the teaching and the theology of Nostra Aetate gives the basis for this apostate demonic idea. Do you understand? This is why I get so vehement against these people is that this is not just disputes. This is not just academic wrangling. This is inviting people to participate in. Do, do people not know how prevalent amongst Roman Catholic priests things like Zen Buddhism is, Buddhist meditation practices and techniques, Hindu practices and techniques amongst Roman Catholic priests? This is very common, very well known and documented by trad Catholic sites for decades. Okay, Entire books, I got a whole shelf up there written on the scandals of this stuff in the last 50 years of the Roman Catholic Church. And you're going to sit there and tell me that this is not promoted by the Vatican? Total baloney. Total baloney. There's not, and by the way, there wasn't just one Assisi gathering. There were two Assisi gatherings that did the same abominable things. It says instead, witness to the unity of the church very generally forbids common worship to Christians. But the grace to be had from it sometimes commends this practice. Yeah. That is totally against the Orthodox teaching. And notice the logic of the Roman Catholic ecumenist position, the Vatican II ecclesiology, that all of the world religions are in a concentric circle ring relationship to the papacy. So the papacy is in the center of the ring. And then you have outside that the uh, Orthodox, because they're the closest. And then outside that is the Protestants and the Anglicans and these people, right? And then outside that is the Evangelicals. And then outside that is the Muslims and the Unitarians. We're all on a concentric circle ring world religion. 
that is what the recent documents and uh, encyclicals of Francis talk about. In fact, Francis even includes prayers for Unitarians. Did you hear me? There's prayers for non-denominational Christians to do with Catholics and Unitarians. Okay, the God of the Bible is not a Unitarian deity. And that's why I'm so vehement against these people is that they are teaching you and leading you into a false world religion. What you see in Abu Dhabi that the Vatican openly supports, the very thing supported by the Enlightenment human, humanist doctrine document that Francis cooked up with the imam. That's the basis for this center. The basis for this Abu Dhabi common faith center is the exact same thing that's in Vatican II. Vatican II's Nostra Aetate says Christians, Jews, Muslims, and Hindus all worship the one God. There's no way that an Orthodox person could say that. The one God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Period. That's it. There is no other one God. There's no generic God that we all worship. And then there's this Trinity option over here. That's called masonry. That's called perennialism. So, these people inadvertently are teaching masonry and perennialism and they don't even know it. But in the midst of the debate, everybody heard Trent say heterodox, ridiculous things. There's no Trinity in the Old Testament. It's a Unitarian God. Where are you getting Trinity in the Old Testament? Uh, Trent, that's a Muslim argument. The Council Fathers do not say what kind of common worship this entails. But this can be understood as an endorsement of passive communion. So he's made up, they just make up terms that are not at all in Mortalium Animos that condemns this wholesale. And it's not just Mortalium Animos. Here's 16 papal documents that contradict what's in Vatican II. Go get this book, The Popes Against the Modern Errors. Everyone needs this book, even Orthodox. Because it clear as day will show you hey, you guys don't teach this anymore. This is night and day with what your Vatican II documents teach. And if anybody doubts this, what are the fruits of the Vatican II Roman Catholic world? Can anybody look at the Roman Catholic Vatican II church world and honestly tell me that the collapsing numbers of vocations, the collapsing numbers of priests, the collapsing churches, the zillions of dollars paid out in pedo lawsuits, Bankruptcy of countless dioceses. Religious institutions going away. Can anyone tell me that the fruits of any of this is good? Right? Oh, I don't, I don't care about all that theology. Okay, well then, what's the fruits of all this? Where attendees pray next to each other or share in a common... Okay, I, I just, I can't do this anymore because... To sit there and tell me to my face that they're not praying together, they're praying next to each other, is just the next level of just baloney. So we're going to open it up now to questions. I mean, we got halfway through. Uh, there's another another hour of this. Um, I mean, I might do a part two of this. We'll see. We'll see how this goes. But I think it's time to move on to the questions because, I mean, I, I just I've had about enough of this. So. Uh, we got super chats. I am going to open it up to uh, Q&A here on the Twitter because we've been live on Twitter for a while. My battery's about to die, so I won't have too long to do Q&A because um, I don't have a way to plug the phone in in here. But um, let's see. We got one more super chance, $50. Wow, thank you. So that's a very generous super chat there. From one more super chance, AD, $5. Is it worth it to read the history of the church by Schaff? Um, I read two volumes of it, and it's a kind of a dated, I think, Anglican, Protestant scholarly work. So you will get some insights, particularly in volume one. I was surprised to see Philip Schaff admitting, um, you know, things like apostolic succession and tradition. So that, that kind of surprised me that he had that in there. But uh, I mean, I think if, you know, if he's an Anglican or whatever, I, I guess that's, uh, that's plausible, but, um, you know, there's some insights, but I think there's, there's probably better works that you could find, uh, nowadays, if you're looking for, you know, a history of the church, um, I would say probably like Pelicans, you know, 
history of the Christian tradition would be a better, uh, more up to date scholarly work than than Philip Schaff's books. But they're not terrible. I mean, I've I've got them up there. They're just kind of old, like the other Schaff stuff. Genghis Khan, ten dollars. Thank you so much, Genghis Khan. Terry, five dollars. Jay Ed Fazer wrote a book uh, defending the death penalty. Oh no! Wait a minute. Uh, why do we need uh, the, the philosopher theologians of the Roman Catholic Church writing books to defend things that the papacy is supposed to make clear and, uh, and indubitable for us? Why, why are we even having to do that, given the fact that their whole selling point is my papacy makes everything clear. We have unity and clarity. You guys don't have it. Ha ha. Oh, but we need all the Roman Catholic theologians to write books to tell us what Francis apparently can't get right. Uh, Terry says, if Fa- if Dr. Ed Fazer has to write books defending the death penalty as the Catholic position, which one is it? Is it Francis or is it Dr. Ed Fazer? Yeah, exactly. Uh, as a Roman Catholic, what... Who are you supposed to listen to? I'm pretty sure you're supposed to listen. I'm pretty sure Francis trumps Ed Fazer, but uh, who knows in the Roman Catholic world? It changes day to day. Uh, maybe tomorrow they'll decide that Ed Fazer is the Pope. Storm the Cat, $5. Hello. What's up, dude? Kristen, $5. Great lecture today. Yeah, I got pretty heated today. I, I was uh, I was ready. I was raring to go today. So uh, I've, I've kind of calmed down. I drank, some, I drank like six shots of espresso so that's partly why i was so hyped up today and getting getting animated also stubbed my toe so that made me mad too uh boomer bone man five dollars me lava you uh okay as long as that's uh in a a hetero way bro (laughs) big scotty twenty dollars hey jay keep up the great work well thank you big scotty bone man again for fifteen dollars can you say more on how the vatican how, how vatican ii attempts to Temper Vatican one with collegiality. With collegiality, thank you for everything. Right, so I think <clears throat> you know at the time of Vatican one, it was very con- the the papal definitions were very controversial, and so there was a lot of theologians who kind of famously uh, dissented from Vatican one. The most famous of which was Ignaz von, von Dollinger. Dollinger was like the f- most famous uh, Roman Catholic historian of his day. And he really had a crisis of conscience for many, many years over whether to uh, sign on to Vatican I or not. And uh, you can read his books. I think they're they're out of they're they're uh, not in copyright, so I think you can buy like uh, you know pretty accessible versions of Dolinger on on uh, Amazon. But uh, he's also mentioned. Uh, there's a whole chapter on him in the Michael Welton book, uh, Two Paths which kind of summarizes the, the whole story with Vatican I and Dollinger. But he's not the only one. There was a lot of other people, too, that were having a really hard time accepting Vatican I. So uh, in Roman Catholic theology uh, and circles, this is called ultramontanism. So ultramontanism is sort of like the the high, high papacy view. Um, I think Vatican I is an ultramontanist view. Just the documents themselves uh to me read that way however some roman catholics will say oh well that's a you know your reading of vatican one is quote ultramontanist and so in the 20th century due to modernism and uh academia you know basically accepting wholesale modernism even in the roman catholic world you got you had quite a few roman catholic theologians that were pretty controversial pretty revolutionary pretty liberal uh, all the way back to uh, Marcel. Um, uh, I've actually got a bunch of the liberal Catholic guys up there. Uh, George Tyrell was another famous one. Um, a lot, and a lot of these people found themselves on the band, the list of banned books, right? So they made it onto the index of banned books. Um, I think, including Tyrell, he was one of the first, uh, you know, sort of modernist people like this. And they they were, you know, harping about Vatican I, A lot of them. Now, it wasn't just Vatican I. They also had, uh, you know, kind of liberal views about morals or they had uh, revolutionary ideas about, uh, you know, making the mass vernacular or they, they had a whole range of ideas, right? Some of them didn't believe the Bible. Some of them thought that there were no miracles. And so you get really extreme people like Skillebex who 
is uh, basically an atheist or a Unitarian. You get Hans Kuhn, who also famously, you know, kind of doesn't really believe Vatican I. So there's a whole range of these liberal uh, 20th century Roman Catholic theologians. There's a, there's a whole gaggle of them. And so part of their uh, approach was not just liturgical reform and, uh, you know, getting rid of Thomism. A lot of them were very critical of Thomism, um, not for like Orthodox reasons, right? For other reasons, um, for maybe they were Kantian, maybe they were postmodern, you know, who knows? But um, in the sphere of, of ecclesiology, you had these ver various theologians. Like I've got some books by um, Avery Dulles. Um, I've got one by... Um, another one of these liberal cardinals, Colonel Bay. Uh, uh, I've got his book on ecclesiology, uh, Avery, Avery Dulles's book on revelation and ecclesiology. And you can see they're, they're very influenced by um, Kantian philosophy, uh, modern philosophy, enlightenment philosophy. And so the same liberal approach that they're going to do to biblical studies, they're also going to do to ecclesiology. And so while I would agree that Vatican I was a bad move, I don't have the same basis for my critique as those liberal Vatican II theologians do. But they became famous for the movement called uh, collegiality, which was the idea that Vatican II was too extreme. And we just need to temper uh, the, the doctrine of the papacy with collegiality. Thus, Vatican II produces documents that really stress collegiality. Uh, and it's not just one, but uh, it, uh, at least a couple of them, I think... Uh, uh, Lumen Gentium stresses a collegiality, and then um, Gaudium at Spes probably does. It's been a long time since I read the Vatican II documents, but there's a couple of them. Uh, Unitatis Redentigratio does. Oh, the decree on the Eastern Churches, right? Orientalium Ecclesiarum. It also stresses collegiality. And so, you know, there's pros and cons to this. I mean, the pros are, okay, the Roman Catholic academic structure is admitting a lot of Orthodox points. However, they're not admitting it for good reasons, right? The only reason that there's the Chieti document is to get Orthodox to come back to Rome. Okay, but why would we go back to you when you've been wrong and you're admitting that you're wrong? You see, you see the logic. Of, so, it's, so it's a geopolitical, ecumenist motivation. And, uh, you know, Dr. Mike, uh, Adam Duvall says right here, how can we reconcile Vatican I and its universalizing claims with the now publicly admitted historical fact? Remember, Trent said we can just look at the facts in an uh, evidentialist, foundationalist way. Just look at the facts. Okay, well, the facts right here from you guys say that there's a contradiction. So am I looking at the facts right, Trent, from a neutral evidentialist standpoint here? Here's the argument, by the way, you guys, you want to read this article? about the key 80 document again i can't pull that i can't send you the key 80 document because the url is too long okay but it's right here you can go read it and it says the orthodox it basically says yeah the orthodox are right about how the church worked in the first thousand years uh so we admit that uh by the way come back to rome uh no <laughs> why would we do that i mean you're wrong why would why would we Oh, go oh, okay. Yeah, you, you were wrong for all these centuries, but we need the papacy because otherwise we'll end up being wrong. I'm not joking, right? That, that, that's the motive. So the motivation here is geopolitical. It's, uh, you know, power struggles. It's ecumenism. It's all this stuff. So that's what collegiality. So collegi collegiality is a mixed bag. On the one hand, it's nice to have the Roman Catholics admitting it, but they're only admitting it because they want to bring the Orthodox back under their sway. Uh, Candlejack, no wait, Shrek, $10. I've watched your material for forever and I feel like I owe you money. Well, you don't owe me money, but thank you for that. Shrek, $10. Uh, I thought, so uh, I'm actually getting, uh, you know, CGI cartoon characters sending money now. So we've actually, this is peak pinnacle uh, internet success here in the postmodern world by having Shrek sending me $10. Candlejack, $3. Don't let him escape and do a part two. Okay, y'all, <clears throat> we've we gone for four hours. So uh, when I have another four hours of energy, we'll do uh, Trent part two. Um, 
What's the best introductory or uh, book to orthodoxy versus Protestantism and Catholicism? Um, probably the Dr. Clark Carlton set, The Way, the Truth, and the Life, three books, Way, Truth, Life. So those are great for both Protestant and Roman Catholic uh, critiques. Patrick for $3. Is Occult Renaissance Church of Rome a worthwhile read? It is uh, because it's a good critique of the um, proto-ecumenism in Rome in the Renaissance. Okay, so um, I think he demonstrates very well that the ecumenist motivation and attitudes of Vatican II aren't new. Even though there was, you know, from 1700 to Vatican II, the papacy was a very, quote, uh, conservative institution in the sense of, um, you know, having many encyclicals against Freemasonry, many encyclicals against liberalism and modernism. Um, the papacy kind of comes and goes in waves and phases of liberalism and conservatism. So if you go back to the Renaissance period of the papacy, that was clearly, you know, Alexander VI, right? That was a very liberal, uh, degenerate phase. And they were all obsessed with magic and occultism and, and you know, Renaissance ma magical tradition. And so that book is good for demonstrating that. Yes. Golden Arm, 2007, $75. Wow. Thank you so much, Golden Arm. Much appreciated. Good stuff. Thank you. Yeah. If you guys would hit like and share. Also remember that I do have a speaking event. I do have private security there. So uh, Trad, you can't come beat me up uh it, you'll get you'll get pounced on by bouncers um but the speaking event will be july 30th it'll be a mix of serious and goofiness and fun uh, i'm going to be talking about the new book that will be the locus of the of the the event i will also have some goofy stuff impressions and whatnot so it's going to be a lot of fun you can also get signed copies there at the event the event is linked below in the show description at eventbrite um, we sold quite a few tickets so go ahead and lock those in because we're still uh, a little under three weeks away from July 30th. So we got 20 days uh, till the event and you can get your tickets there. Uh, you can also get the pre-orders in still now. Uh, so this is kind of confusing because people are getting their book from Amazon. So the reason for this is because uh, as an author, when I order my copies, I ordered a gigantic batch of books and to order a gigantic batch with the way the supply chains are now actually means that it takes longer for me, the author of the book, to get the book than people who bought it on Amazon. So Amazon has individual copies before I have my gigantic uh, load of books. So that's why people are getting their book before me. And thank you so much to the people who did give the new book uh, good reviews. Really appreciate that. Um, everybody seems to be really enjoying it for the people that do have their copies and have read the Kindle versions. Uh, also, guys, remember, too, that uh, we'll take some... Uh, uh, questions here from the uh, tw uh, Twitter audience in a second, but remember that you can support me uh, as well over on Rockfin. Rockfin is a great free speech based platform. And guys, if you want to beef up that masculinity, you want to get that manly juice flowing in your body, then you want to head on over to chalk.com. That's C-H-O-Q.com. They have the best supplements out there. They're an awesome based red pill company. All of their ingredients are 100% rainforest source organic cold pressed adaptogens you can't beat that they're the best out there use the promo code j50 that's jay50 to get 50 percent off of any of the products they have there if you want to set up recurring subscriptions that's also an advan uh, advantageous thing because uh, you know if you like it you don't want to have to go back and put all the information in again a month from now you can just set up the recurring subscription and there's also a little bit more of a discount use the promo code j53 life that's j53 l-i-f-e and so use those promo codes. You definitely want to get a hold of the uh, Tonkat Ali. Uh, I took a break from the Tonkat because it's so strong. And then I've been using it again the last week. So you want to know why I'm hyped up, why I got so much energy. It's not just the espresso. It's not just because I stubbed my toe a minute ago. It's also because of that freaking Tonkat Ali. I mean, it just gets me. It's like catnip for me, baby. It's catnip for Dyer. And I love it. So Tonka Ali, 100% proven to boost testosterone, peer-reviewed studies. Go look it up. I'm not joking. It's legit. Also, if you like what's legit, if you're too legit to quit, I recommend the She Legit. She Legit is also too legit to quit because Jamie takes She Legit every day. And, dude, she's been reading more than me. She read five, five Elvis books in a week. And I'm over here amazed. Like, how did you read five Elvis books in a week? And she's like, because I've been taking She Legit. So, I mean, pfft. hey, it works for her. Great for the ladies. Great for mental clarity and focus. There's also the Action 2.0 if you just want to boost that energy, baby. Get a little boost. I'm not talking about grandma's boost. 
Okay, grandma's over there drinking that nasty, syrupy, white boost stuff. No, no, no. I'm talking about energy boost. Okay, not grandma, not grandma boost, energy boost. Uh, there's also the daily. Again, use the promo code J50 to get 50% off of any of the products. Uh, we're also, on, we've only got one bag left of the chocolate, which is up there. I don't know if you can see it. Chocolate, is, of course, is a superfood. Uh, it's a great replacement for if you like hot chocolate, if you like chocolate milk. I don't know about no chocolate milk now. I don't drink that, but uh, some people do. And if you like that and you want a healthier replacement, this is what you want because it does taste like hot chocolate. I mean, it's it's legit good, just like the she legit is good. So get some of that chocolate powder. Jamie also drinks that every night after dinner. She loves it. We're going to have to get some more of that here in a little bit. But uh, by the way, guys, we'll have some uh, free giveaways too from Chalk uh, at the speaking event. It, by the way, I forgot to tell you, it's from 4 to 10. So if you want to lock in those tickets, go ahead and do that. Um, 4 to 10 p.m. You don't have to stay the whole time. People are like, do I have to come? No, I don't care. You can do whatever you want, dude. You you can stay uh, you can stay till after I leave if you want. I mean they might lock you in there, but you can do what you want. And so the uh, first hour we're gonna have uh, fun. We're gonna be joking around, just uh, you know icebreakers basically. Uh, then the next hour Jamie will do her presentation uh, on Hollywood. She'll probably be talking about you know Elvis, feminism, this kind of stuff. She just did a good interview with uh, Rachel over on her podcast channel. So go check out Jamie's podcast at Jamie Hanshaw. They just did a, a, a podcast on Rachel's book, Occult Feminism. That was a great podcast. Go check that out. Um, so Jamie will give her talk. Uh, then we'll probably break for dinner. I'm not feeding you. I'm sorry. I just can't. The, the, it's it's North Nashville. There's no way for me to feed uh, an enjo- a big hall full of people. Uh, so you're going to have to get your own food. But the good news is that when, since we're in a little bit of North Nashville, we're not right in downtown, it'll be easy to find food and come back. If we were in downtown Nashville, it would be a nightmare to get anywhere. It's super packed, especially during the summer. I mean, Nashville's turning into Austin. So it's going to be crazy downtown. However, if you do come in for the weekend, a lot of people said they're going to be flying in, so they'll probably stay for the whole weekend. Uh, we will be going to church. Uh, there will be uh, uh, Orthodox Church you can attend. Um, uh, and there will be, uh, you know, festivities for those that want to hang out in Nashville. I can't guarantee you that I'm going to hang out with you for the whole weekend, but, uh, you know, we probably go find some fun stuff to do and, you know, you can't beat me up because of hard security. So there you go. Uh, also I do believe in self-defense and I do own an L U G E R. So again, keep that in mind. Uh, let's go to the chat. So, uh, let's see if we had any questions from the Twitter audience here. Uh, we've been going for four hours. We've got 44 nerds up in there. There was a dude that came in here and he was a Newsweek journalist. I didn't trust that at all. I was like, nope. <laughs> Later, dude. Uh, let's see here. Jakey. What's up, Jakey? You just had to, got to hit unmute. Hi, G. Yes, sir. How you doing? Doing great. What's up, man? I'm sweating in here. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Talk to you, man. Okay. I'm, I'm from Scotland. Oh. Um, are you? Are you now? Yeah. Are you, lassie? Yeah. I'm, are you I'm from the from Highlands? <laughs> this Glasgow. Could you chop off the head of Sean Connery? Can you chop his head off? <laughs> yeah. You could. You could. You could chop off the head of uh, Sean Connery. Have you seen The Highlander? Yeah, okay. the clouds, the clouds. The cloud, yeah. What's up, dude? <laughs> yeah, I'm good, I'm good, man. I'm, I, I've recently converted to Catholicism. Um, so I thought, I've got bedrock, I've got solid ground to stand on, but then we've got this synod. We had a synod. What now? The synod, the synod, the synod. Synod, okay. Through. Yeah. Okay, what about it? And it, it's just, it makes me very uncomfortable, a wee bit uncomfortable about... What it's going to bring, like, I think it's going to change the Catholic Church's teachings on... Oh, on yeah. Uh, you know, it's like... Probably. I feel like it's, it's like shifting sands I'm standing on now. I mean, but, right. So I just want to... It's like... I don't know what your thoughts are on that. It feels like... I'm not going to say this. I'm not going to say we're just... The church is just following modernity, modernity. But it feels like it just doesn't really fight back. 
Yeah, I think that what's happened, right, I think what has happened is that the papacy has become a tool of geopolitical powers. And so uh, the Orthodox Church is not immune to that. This is a problem that exists in any church. But the problem is that it, every, it's a house of cards built on just the papacy. So if the papacy falls, then the bad part of that is that the whole system is kind of captive to, you know, whoever uh, Francis's handlers are, and they don't seem to be very nice people. It's the Jesuits. American magazine. Well, I don't know if it's Jesuits as much as it is just the um, Anglo-American power structure, uh, you know, has enough power to, you know, blackmail uh, the, the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church through the, the SCXUAL stuff, and a lot of those people are blackmailed. And so that's a big part of it. And I think that that's part of the reason for resignation of uh, Benedict. A lot of that came out that they kind of forced Benedict to resign because there was so much pedo blackmail stuff. This is hope you ever even have us in your prayers, Jay, um, you know, as Catholics. Yeah, well, I want to stress too. I don't hate you guys. I was a Catholic, so I understand what it's like. I just don't. I don't like seeing people deceived, and I don't like seeing people uh, uh, duped and led into things that that I think are damaging and, and spiritually harmful. That's that's the whole modus operandi here. So I don't hate you. I don't hate Trent. I don't uh, hate Roman Catholics. We just want them to not be, you know, duped. That's it. Okay. Anything else, man? No, I, I think that's like, it's good to talk to you, man. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Big, big, big Nicholas Cage fan, just like yourself. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That's excellent. Talk to you later. All right. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate that, dude. Um, oops. I think I X'd out the whole thing. I didn't mean to. Well, there went that. Uh, anyway, I'm in here sweating, dude. It's hot in here. It's like 100 degrees where I'm at. This room is hot, too. Uh, all right, thank you guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I may I may buckle down and do a part two too, but uh, you know it took. We already did four hours and we only got halfway through Trent's uh, Trent's thing. So uh, Trent, if you watch this, I don't hate you. Uh, I don't think your rebuttals were very good, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I wish you well. I hope that you become Orthodox. We pray for the conversion of all of the people that uh, are opposed to us on the spectrum the nice ones and the mean ones. So we, we hope that they all convert. Uh, 